Thanks for visiting Timeless Audiobooks. Please remember to like, comment, share and subscribe for our latest audiobook uploads. Section 1 of Stories in the Dark This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dan Grzynski. Stories in the Dark by Barry Payne. The Diary of a God. During the week, there had been several thunderstorms. It was after the last of these, on a cool Saturday evening, that he was found at the top of the hill by a shepherd. His speech was incoherent and disconnected. He gave his name correctly, but could or would add no account of himself. He was wet through and sat there, pulling a sprig of heather to pieces. The shepherd afterwards said that he had great difficulty in persuading him to come down, and that he talked much nonsense. In the path at the foot of the hill he was recognized by some people from the farmhouse where he was lodging, and was taken back there. They had indeed gone out to look for him. He was subsequently removed to an asylum and died insane a few months later. Two years afterwards, when the furniture of the farmhouse came to be sold by auction, there was found in a little cupboard in the bedroom, which he had occupied, an ordinary penny exercise book. This was partly filled in a beautiful and very regular handwriting, with what seems to have been something in the nature of a diary, and the following are extracts from it. June 1st. It is absolutely essential to be quiet. I am beginning life again, and in quite a different way, and on quite a different scale, and I cannot make the break suddenly. I must have a pause of a few weeks in between the two different lives. I saw the advertisement of the lodgings in this farmhouse in an evening paper that somebody had left at the restaurant. That was when I was trying to make the change abruptly, and I may as well make a note of what happened. After attending the funeral, which seemed to me an act of hypocrisy, as I hardly knew the man, but it was expected of me, I came back to my Charlotte Street rooms and had tea. I slept well that night. Then next morning I went to the office at the usual hour in my best clothes, and with a deep band still on my hat. I went to Mr. Toller's room and knocked. He said, Come in. And after I had entered, Can I do anything for you? What do you want? Then I explained to him that I had wished to leave at once. He said, This seems sudden after thirty years' service. Yes, I replied, I have served you faithfully for thirty years, but things have changed, and I have now three hundred a year of my own. I will pay something in lien of notice, if you like, but I cannot go on being a clerk any more. I hope, Mr. Toller, you will not think that I speak with any impertinence to yourself or any immodesty, but I am really in the position of a private gentleman. He looked at me curiously, and as he did not say anything, I repeated, I think I am in the position of a private gentleman. In the end he let me go, and said very politely he was sorry to lose me. I said good-bye to the other clerks, even to those who had sometimes laughed at what they imagined to be my peculiarities. I gave the better of the two office boys a small present in money. I went back to the Charlotte Street rooms, but there was nothing to do there. There were figures going on in my head, and my fingers seemed to be running up and down columns. I had a stupid idea that I should be in trouble if Mr. Toller were to come in and catch me like that. I went out and had a capital lunch, and then I went to the theater. I took a stall right in the front row, and sat there all by myself. Then I had a cab to the restaurant. It was too soon for dinner, so I ordered a whiskey and soda and smoked a few cigarettes. The man at the table next to me left the evening paper in which I saw the advertisement of these farmhouse lodgings. I read the whole of the paper, but I have forgotten it all except that advertisement, and I could say it by heart now, all about bracing air and perfect quiet and the rest of it. For dinner I had a bottle of champagne. The waiter handed me a list, and asked which I would prefer. I waved the list away and said, Give me the best. 
He smiled. He kept on smiling all through dinner until the end. Then he looked serious. He kept getting more serious. Then he brought two other men to look at me. They spoke to me, but I did not want to talk. I think I fell asleep. I found myself in my rooms in Charlotte Street next morning, and my landlady gave me notice, because she said I had come home beastly drunk. Then that advertisement flashed into my mind about the bracing air. I said, I should have given you notice in any case. This is not a suitable place for a gentleman. June 3rd. I am rather sorry that I wrote down the above. It seems so degrading. However, it was merely an act of ignorance and carelessness on my part. And besides, I am writing solely for myself. To myself, I may own freely that I made a mistake. That I was not used to the wine, and that I had not fully gauged what the effects would be. The incident is disgusting, but I simply put it behind me and think no more about it. I pay here two pounds ten shillings a week for my two rooms and board. I take my meals, of course, by myself in the sitting room. It would be rather cheaper if I took them with the family, but I do not care about that. After all, what is two pounds ten shillings a week? Roughly speaking, a hundred and thirty pounds a year. June 17th. I have made no entry in my diary for some days. For a certain period I have had no heart for that or for anything else. I had told the people here that I was a private gentleman, which is strictly true, and that I was engaged in literary pursuits. By the latter I mean to imply no more than that I am fond of reading, and that it is my intention to jot down from time to time my sensations and experiences in the new life which has burst upon me. At the same time I have been greatly depressed. Why, I can hardly explain. I have been furious with myself, sitting in my own sitting room, with a gold-tipped cigarette between my fingers. I have been possessed, even though I recognized it as an absurdity, by a feeling that if Mr. Toller were to come in suddenly, I should get up and apologize. But the thing which depressed me most was the open country. I have read, of course, those penny stories about the poor little ragged boys who never see the green leaf in their lives, and I always thought them exaggerated. So they are exaggerated. There are the embankment gardens with the press band playing. There are parks. There are Sunday school treats. All these little ragged boys see the green leaf, and to say they do not is an exaggeration. I am afraid a willful exaggeration. But to see the open country is quite a different thing. Yesterday was a fine day, and I was out all day in a place called Wensley Dale. On one spot where I stood, I could see for miles all around. There was not a single house or tree or human being in sight. There was just myself on the top of a moor. The bigness of it gave me a regular scare. I suppose I had got used to walls. I had got used to feeling that if I went straight ahead without stopping, I should knock against something. That somehow made me feel safe. Out on that great moor, just as if I were the last man left alive in the world, I did not feel safe. I find the track and get home again, and I tremble like a half-drowned kitten until I see a wall again, or somebody with a surly face who does not answer civilly when I speak to him. All these feelings will wear off, no doubt, and I shall be able to enter upon the new phase of my existence without any discomfort. But I was quite right to take a few months' quiet retirement. One must get used to things gradually. It was the same with the champagne, to which, by the way, I had not meant to allude any further. June 20th it is remarkable to what a fascination these very large moors have for me. It is not exactly fear any more. Indeed, it must be the reverse. I do not care to be anywhere else. Instead of making this a mere pause between two different existences, I shall continue it. To that I have quite made up my mind. When I am out there in a place where I cannot see any trees or houses or living things, I am the last person left alive in the world. 
I am a kind of a god. There is nobody to think anything at all about me, and it does not matter if my clothes are not right, or if I drop an H, which I rarely do except when speaking very quickly. I never knew what real independence was before. There have been too many houses around, and too many people looking on. It seems to me now such a common and despicable thing to live among people, and to have one's character and one's ways altered by what they are going to think. I know now that when I ordered that bottle of champagne I did it for more to please the waiter and to make him think well of me than to please myself. I pity the kind of creature that I was then, but I had not known the open country at that time. It is a grand education. If Toller were to come in now, I should say, go away, go back to your bricks and mortar, and account books, and swell friends, and white waistcoats, and rubbish of that kind. You cannot possibly understand me, and your presence irritates me. If you do not go at once, I will have the dog let loose upon you. By the way, that was a curious thing which happened the other day. I feed the dog, a mastiff, regularly, and it goes out with me. We had walked some way, and had reached that spot where a man becomes the last man alive in the world. Suddenly the dog began to howl, and ran off home with its tail between its legs, as if it were frightened of something. What was it that the dog had seen and I had not seen? A ghost? In broad daylight? Well, if the dead come back, they might walk here without contamination. A few sheep? A sweep of heather? A gray sky, but nothing that a living man planted or built. They could be alone here. If it were not that it would seem a kind of blasphemy, I would buy a piece of land in the very middle of the loneliest moor and build myself a cottage there. June 23rd. I received a letter today from Julia. Of course, she does not understand the change which has taken place in me. She writes as she always used to write, and I find it very hard to remember and realize that I liked it once, and was glad when I got a letter from her. That was before I got into the habit of going into empty places, alone. The old clerking, account book life has become too small to care about. The swell life of the private gentleman to which I looked forward is also not worth considering. As for Julia, I was to have married her. I used to kiss her. She wrote to say that she thought a great deal of me. She still writes. I don't want her. I don't want anything. I have become the last man alive in the world. I shall leave this farmhouse very soon. The people are all right, but they are people, and therefore insufferable. I can no longer live or breathe in a place where I see people or trees which people have planted, or houses which people have built. It is an ugly word, people. July 7th. I was wrong in saying that I was the last man alive in the world. I believe I am dead. I know now why the Mastiff howled and ran away. The whole moor is full of them. One sees them after a time when one has got used to the open country. Or perhaps it is because one is dead. Now I see them by moonlight and sunlight, and I'm not frightened at all. I think I must be dead, because there seems to be a line ruled straight through my life, and the things which happen down the further side of the line are not real. I look over this diary and see some references to a Mr. Toller, and to some champagne, and coming into money. I cannot for the life of me think what it is all about. I suppose the incidents described really happened, unless I was mad when I wrote about them. I suppose that I am not dead, since I can write in a book, and eat food, and walk, and sleep, and wake again. But since I see them now, these people that fill up the lonely places, I must be quite different to ordinary human beings. If I am not dead, then what am I? Today I came across an old letter signed Julia Jarvis. The envelope was addressed to me. I wonder who on earth she was. 
July 9th. A man in a frock coat came to see me and talked about my best interest. He wanted me, as far as I could gather, to come away with him somewhere. He said I was all right, or, at any rate, would become all right with a little care. He would not go away until I said that I would kill him. Then the woman at the farmhouse came up with a white face, and I said I would kill her, too. I positively cannot endure people. I am something apart, something different. I am not alive, and I am not dead. I cannot imagine what I am. July 16th. I have settled the whole thing to my complete satisfaction. I can without doubt believe the evidence of my own senses. I have seen and I have heard. I know now that I am a god. I had almost thought before that this might be. What was the matter was that I was too diffident. I had no self-confidence. I had never heard before of any man, even a clerk, in an old established firm who had become a god. I therefore supposed it was impossible until it was distinctly proved to be. I had often made up my mind to go to that range of hills that lies to the north. They are purple when one sees them far off. At nearer view they are gray. Then they become green. Then one sees a silver network over the green. The silver network is made by streams descending in the sunlight. I climbed the hill slowly. The air was still and the heat was terrible. Even the water which I drank from the running stream seemed flat and warm. As I climbed, the storm broke. I took but little notice of it for the dead that I had met below on the moor had told me that lightning could not touch me. At the top of the hill I turned and saw the storm raging beneath my feet. It is the greatest of mercies that I went there, for that is where the other gods gather, at such times as the lightning plays between them, and the earth and the black thunderclouds hanging low shut them out from the sight of men. Some of the gods were rather like the big pictures that I have seen on the hoardings, advertising plays at the theater or some food which is supposed to give great strength and muscular development. They were handsome in face and without any expression. They never seemed to be angry or pleased or hurt. They sat there in great long rows resting, with the storm raging in between them and the earth. One of them was a woman. I spoke to her, and she told me that she was older than this earth, yet she had the face of a young girl, and her eyes were like eyes that I have seen before somewhere. I cannot think where I saw the eyes, like those of the goddess, but perhaps it was in that part of my life which is forgotten and ruled off with a line. It gave me one of the greatest and most majestic feelings to stand there with the gods, and to know that one was a god oneself, and that lightning did not hurt one, and that one would live forever. July 18th. This afternoon the storm returned, and I hurried to the meeting place. But it is far away to the hills, and though I climbed as quickly as I could, the storm was almost past, and they had gone. August 1st. I was told in my sleep that tomorrow I was to go back to the hill again, and that once more the gods would be there, and that the storm would gather round us, and would shut us from the profane sight, and the steely lightnings would blind any eye that tried to look upon us. For this reason I have refused now to eat or drink anything. I am a god, and have no need of such things. It is strange that now when I see all real things so clearly and easily, the ghosts of the dead that walk across the moors in the sunlight and the concourse of the gods on the hilltop above the storm, men and women with whom I once moved before I became a god, are no more to me than so many black shadows. I scarcely know one from the other, only that the presence of a black shadow anywhere near me makes me angry and a desire to kill it that will pass away. It is probably some faint relic of the thing that I once was in the other side of my life, on the other side of the line which has been ruled across it. Seeing that I am a god, 
It is not natural that I can feel anger or joy any more. Already all feeling of joy has gone from me, for tomorrow, so I was told in my sleep, I am to be betrothed to the beautiful goddess that is older than the world, and yet looks like a young girl, and she is to give me a sprig of heather as a token, and... It was on the evening of August 1 he was found. End of Section 1《セクション2 of Stories in the Dark》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis《Stories in the Dark》by Barry Payne This is all. It was a very hot summer day. The doctor's brougham had been waiting in the shade of the Chestnut Avenue, leading to the big white house. Then a servant brought out a message. "'Morning, Jameson. He knew the coachman. Stopping to luncheon. You're to go round to the stables. I guessed as much. What, is he worse this morning? No, not a bit of it. Then, confidentially, between ourselves, there's no more the matter with Mr. Wyatt, nor there is with you nor me. So I've always supposed. If you can be surprised at anything, you will not make a good coachman. Well, see you again later. And the wheels crunched slowly along the gravel. In the meantime, Mr. Alexander Wyatt paced the entire length of his great library. He was lean, tall, bent in the shoulders. His hair was gray and rather too long. His face was clean-shaven and ashy in color. He looked worried, hunted. Dr. Holling watched him narrowly. The doctor was no younger, but his hair was black. He was a giant. His chest was broad and deep, and he stood six foot three in his socks. His face was slightly florid, and his figure showed some tendency towards corpulence. But he looked like a man of the world, and not like a mere sensualist. There was that distinction. Under the heavy brows were the eyes of a man who knows what he wants to know, and is quite sure that he knows it. He looked confident and clever. "'My dear fellow,' said the doctor, the long and short of it is that you ought to have come to me long ago. I don't mean in Harley Street. I mean here at home. Of course, I wouldn't see any ordinary patient here, but an old friend like you. Yes, really, you ought to have come to me. I might have gone up to Harley Street. It's only an hour away. You go there and back most days in the year, and I might have taken the journey for once. I don't know why I didn't. I'd thought of it, but you're always so busy. Busy? Well, yes, but I don't let myself be so busy that I can't see a friend who's ill. Wyatt sighed heavily. And now you're spoiling one of your rare holidays for my sake. I say, old man, do take a fee, a proper fee, something in proportion. Now, don't talk like that. If fees had had anything to do with it, could I have come to you and suggested that it might be as well if I just went over you? Besides, I wouldn't give up a day of my holiday for any fee. Why should I? I've already made more money than I shall ever spend. I'm not stopping because I've got a patient. I'm stopping because an old friend is ill. It's very good of you. Very, very good." Come back to the point. Why didn't you send for me before? You must have known that you were ill. I had my suspicions. I, I didn't want to think about it. And so you waited until, from mere casual observation, I also had my suspicions and told you so. I think you were foolish. Come now, what were you afraid of? I haven't hurt you. No, no, said Wyatt. Of course not but I didn't want to know that I was going to die. There was a longish pause, and Wyatt's eyes grew rounder and stared. Oh, my God! Oh, my God! He muttered to himself. 
well said dr holling he hated these exhibitions but he spoke sympathetically i can't die stammered wyatt it 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 mustn't be you will find ultimately that you can die said dr holling we all shall if you will persist in working yourself up into this condition of shivering coward of nervous panic you will die rather sooner or possibly very much sooner than you otherwise would come man you may have another ten or a dozen years if you'll avoid every kind of stress you're wealthy have no ambitions have no hard work are not passionately attached to anybody it is highly unlikely that the stress will come upon you from the outside take care that it does not come from yourself you're right you're right i shall pull myself together he said but he still spoke excitedly i i only gave way for the moment ten or a dozen years at the least with absolute moderation quiet living self-restraint and so on who knows that it might not be a score of years the doctor looked at him curiously and said nothing there you see i'm all right i've faced the situation and now tell me exactly what's the matter with me heart said the doctor laconically i know that wyatt said irritably i want to know the name of the disease and if there's any complication well i shan't tell you you'd try to look yourself up in your old edition of robert's theory and practice of medicine and you'd find something more or less like yourself and it wouldn't do you any good some doctors would have told me hang it then go and ask them said dr holling quite quietly whomever else i meet in consultation it's quite certain i won't meet my own patient of course not i only mentioned it i'm not silly enough to go to any other doctor never dreamed of it of course i know very well that you're the first man on heart i'm not so ignorant of medicine as you suppose ah said the doctor cheerfully i wish you were twice as ignorant or else knew a thousand times as much as you do luncheon was announced the doctor rose smiling poor wyatt did what he could during luncheon to shake off the heavy depression that weighed on him but he did not make much of a host he could only talk of his own illness and speculate on what death really was on these subjects dr holling had little to say but he spoke of the rising value of land in the neighbourhood and wyatt was a landlord wyatt heard with a wretchedly simulated cheerfulness on his sad-eyed sallow face what would it profit him though he gained the whole world wyatt had been in his day the brightest and best of companions but when a man's material heart within him has taken on autumnal tints the man's spirits droop also both the doctor knew were symptomatic and he who knew this and had known the old wyatt was patient but when he was being driven away from the great white house he became very sad that afternoon wyatt sat crouching in a big easy chair in his library alone it was a hot day but he had a shawl wrapped round his feet latterly his feet had been always cold as though already they felt the chill of wet earth there was a pile of books on the table beside him and on the floor he turned avidly and restlessly from one to the other there were comforting books of religion there were terrifying books of religion there were works of metaphysics there were blasphemous diatribes there was science conscious of its limitations now he would take for company some drunken tinker jeering at the notion of a hereafter repelling by its brutal ignorance but appealing by its complete self-confidence and now again he would hear the calm voice of science there are beautiful stories but i dare not tell you that they are true 
in some places where it has been possible to test them i have tested and found they were not true as to the rest those stories seemed more beautiful than probable i still wait for verification or disproof not with folded hands but working at other things he had always feared death and now for many long days and nights he had busied himself in this futile search for something certain about it he heard a hundred voices all crying differently and knew not to which he should listen he used to make attempts from time to time to pull himself together he made one now what does all this concern me he said aloud i'm not going to die holling said so holling gave me twenty years with reasonable care and he knows what he's talking about he pushed the books aside contemptuously pack of nonsense he picked up instead a catalogue that his wine merchant had sent him there was some port of a fairly recent vintage that he wished to put down that's it he said marking the catalogue with pencil we'll say fifty dozen he rubbed his chilly hands together and hummed a light tune at five his man jackson brought him in a glass of whiskey and water carefully measured wyatt had got into the habit of drinking a good deal of strong tea in the afternoon while he pottered over his collections one philatelic the other eighteenth-century autographs the doctor had forbidden tea and wyatt even when he was pulling himself together obeyed the doctor holling had forbidden late hours also wyatt had induced actually induced the habit of insomnia before the doctor's interference he would never go to bed before two or three in the morning after one of his own delightful dinners or if he had been dining out he would still sit up he professed that these hours were of incalculable value that he could not live in society unless for a little time each day he lived absolutely alone all the lights were put out except in the library the rest of the house went to sleep wyatt smoked read thought about things at intervals he sipped strong coffee it was only when he found himself unable to keep awake that he lit his candle and went upstairs every night or early morning as his candle lit the long mirror on the landing he saw himself reflected and the reflection always came as a surprise he never looked as he supposed that he looked sometimes the reflection seemed almost unrecognizable i can't sleep before three in the morning wyatt had maintained to the doctor then it must be morphia said holling he called that night with a hypodermic syringe and that night wyatt went up to bed at ten o'clock and slept at once but i mustn't go on with morphia of course said wyatt knowingly it won't be necessary said holling you see after i've given it you for three nights i shall have broken through your habit then you at once return to the normal state and go to sleep at the ordinary time the doctor reeled off this absolute nonsense with an air of the utmost gravity and conviction he knew his patient he had never given him any morphia at all he had punctured the skin but injected nothing wyatt's insomnia yielded completely to discreet and masterly humbug and the abolition of his after-dinner coffee strong tea and late hours were quite given up now wyatt was positively anxious to give things up in his mad terror of death he had grown to regard it as a monster to be appeased by sacrifice he had a notion vague but deeply rooted that the more he gave up the longer he would live he was almost disappointed that the doctor did not forbid stimulants jackson wyatt's servant had been with him for twenty years when wyatt was alone it was jackson himself who made the after-dinner coffee for on this point wyatt mistrusted women jackson was a creature of habit for over a week he had diligently remembered that coffee was forbidden to-night he forgot it 
habit asserted itself and twenty minutes after wyatt had left the dining-room for the library jackson entered the library with the coffee he was considerably startled at his reception fits of deep depression sometimes alternate with fits of extreme irritation wyatt flew into a mad rage he swore the wretched man was trying to kill him ordered him out of the house and abused him virulently loudly and at length go go he shrieked finally jackson conveyed the news to the kitchen that there was only one thing the matter with mr wyatt he was clean off his head that was all as jackson left the library wyatt dropped into a chair his face contorted covered with sweat bending forward his hands tightly fixed against his chest that awful anginal pain no it had never been like that before it must mean death oh if he could only get to that bell he tried to call the words dr hoing at once came out in a whisper the pain ceased almost suddenly a strange calm came over him and for the first time in many days he thought of other people dr holling of course he would not send for him it would be too bad at that time of night altogether too bad besides it was his own fault he had given way to temper and had been punished for it why he might have died upon his word it would have served him right if he had died poor jackson it was the first time in his life that he had spoken to jackson like that well when he came to die jackson was remembered in his will and would forgive him after all why live so long at such care with such trouble nature calls obey cheerfully and the calm became drowsiness and the drowsiness became sleep all very quickly it was a lovely sleep with a consciousness of well-being permeating its faintly sketched dreams jackson looked in at ten o'clock at a quarter past at twenty-five minutes past and at half past then he sought mrs palfrey the housekeeper he's still asleep said jackson you're sure it's sleep said mrs palfrey gloomily oh i leave to-morrow anyhow whatever he says said jackson it's the responsibility i can't stand it's wearing me but come and see for yourself they opened the library door cautiously and peered in the top of his shirt front's moving said mrs palfrey in an undertone he's asleep don't he look awful i won't wake him i swear i won't wake him better not put his candle on the table by the lamp cough as if accidental as you go out then if he wakes so much the better if not well i'll go to bed and you'll put the lights out same as in the old days jackson shivered and followed this advice carefully the cough as if accidental was unavailing and the lights were put out only in the library the lamplight fell on the gleaming shirt front still moving and on the landing the full-length mirror waited its eyes closed in the darkness but ready to wake as the lighted candle came slowly up the staircase and to reflect in a moment the figure of the master of the house dishevelled late on his way to bed he was awake the lamp had burned itself out the dawn the early midsummer dawn was already advanced its light came tempered yet sufficient through the ugly venetian blinds from the garden and the country beyond came the shrill concert of innumerable birds a heavy cart jolted and bumped to early work on some distant road no there was no need of the candle he would go to bed by daylight with that delightful sense of well-being that firm conviction that there was no good in worry or argument still comforting him ah 
how often at this hour he had trod the stairs with a fantastic curiosity to see what he looked like in the tall mirror by this time his head should have appeared in it coming close to the japanese cabinet there in the mirror gleamed the pale gold of the cabinet and there was the blue and white of the tall oriental vase and there were the masses of dark shadow beyond alexander wyatt found all there but himself him only the mirror gave back no more back back to the library as in a panic something has happened and there in the library the spirit of alexander wyatt that the mirror saw not found in the easy chair the huddled body dressed in clothes that no longer moved to the breathing i'm dead said alexander wyatt and this 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 is all end of section two Section 3 of Stories in the Dark. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Dahlman. Stories in the Dark by Barry Payne. The Moon Slave. The Princess Viola had, even in her childhood, an inevitable submission to the dance. A rhythmical madness in her blood answered hotly to the dance music, swaying her as the wind sways trees, two movements of perfect sympathy and grace. For the rest, she had her beauty and her long hair that reached to her knees, and was thought lovable, but she was never very fervent and vivid unless she was dancing. At other times there almost seemed to be a touch of lethargy upon her. Now when she was sixteen years old, she was betrothed to the Prince Hugo. With others the betrothal was merely a question of state. With her it was merely a question of obedience to the wishes of authority. It had been arranged. Hugo was come si consa, no god in her eyes but it did not matter but with hugo it was quite different he loved her the betrothal was celebrated by a banquet and afterwards by a dance in the great hall of the palace from this dance the princess soon made her escape quite discontented and went to the farthest part of the palace gardens where she could no longer hear the music calling her they are all right she said to herself as she thought of the men she had left but they cannot dance mechanically they are all right they have learned it and don't make childish mistakes but they are only one two three machines they haven't the inspiration of dancing it is so different when i dance alone she wandered on until she reached an old forsaken maze it had been planned by a former king all round it was a high crumbling wall with foxgloves growing on it the maze itself had all its paths bordered with high opaque hedges in the very centre was a circular open space with tall pine trees growing round it many years ago the clue to the maze had been lost it was but rarely now that any one entered it its gravel paths were green with leaves and in some places the hedges spreading beyond their borders had made the way almost impassable for a moment or two viola stood peering in at the gate a narrow gate with curiously twisted bars of wrought iron surmounted by a heraldic device then the whim seized her to enter the maze and try to find the space in the centre she opened the gate and went in outside everything was uncannily visible in the light of the full moon but here in the dark shaded alleys the night was conscious of itself she soon forgot her purpose and wandered about quite aimlessly sometimes forcing her way where the brambles had flung a laced barrier across her path and a dragging mass of convolvulus struck wet and cool upon her cheek as chance would have it she suddenly found herself standing under the tall pines and looking at the open space that formed the goal of the maze she was pleased that she had got there here the ground was carpeted with sand fine and as it seemed beaten hard from the summer night sky immediately above the moonlight unobstructed here streamed straight down upon the scene viola began to think about dancing over the dry smooth sand her little satin shoes moved easily stepping and gliding 
circling and stepping as she hummed the tune to which they moved in the centre of the space she paused looked at the wall of dark trees all round at the shining stretches of silvery sand and at the moon above my beautiful moonlit lonely old dancing room why did i never find you before she cried but she added you need music there must be music here in her fantastic mood she stretched her soft clasped hands upwards towards the moon sweet moon she said in a kind of mock prayer make your white light come down in music into my dancing-room here and i will dance most deliciously for you to see she flung her head backwards and let her hands fall her eyes were half closed and her mouth was a kissing mouth ah sweet moon she whispered do this for me and i will be your slave i will be what you will quite suddenly the air was filled with the sound of a grand invisible orchestra viola did not stop to wonder to the music of a slow saraband she swayed and postured in the music there was a regular beat of small drums and a perpetual drone the air seemed to be filled with the perfume of some bitter spice viola could almost fancy that she saw the smouldering campfire and heard far off the roar of some desolate wild beast she let her long hair fall raising the heavy strands of it in either hand as she moved slowly to the laden music slowly her body swayed with drowsy grace slowly her satin shoes slid over the silver sand the music ceased with a clash of cymbals viola rubbed her eyes she fastened her hair up carefully again suddenly she looked up almost imperiously music more music she cried once more the music came this time it was a dance of caprice pelting along over the violin strings leaping laughing wanton again an illusion seemed to cross her eyes an old king was watching her a king with the sordid history of the exhaustion of pleasure written on his flaccid face a hook-nosed courtier by his side settled the ruffles at his wrist and mumbled ravissante quel malheur que la vieilles it was a strange illusion faster and faster she sped to the music stepping spinning pirouetting the dance was light as thistledown fierce as fire smooth as a rapid stream the moment that the music ceased viola became horribly afraid she turned and fled away from the moonlit space through the trees down the dark alleys of the maze not heeding in the least which turn she took and yet she found herself soon at the outside iron gate from thence she ran through the palace garden hardly ever pausing to take a breath until she reached the palace itself in the eastern sky the first signs of dawn were showing in the palace the festivities were drawing to an end as she stood alone in the outer hall prince hugo came towards her where have you been viola he said sternly what have you been doing she stamped her little foot i will not be questioned she replied angrily i have some right to question he said she laughed a little for the first time in my life she said i have been dancing he turned away in hopeless silence the months passed away slowly a great fear came over viola a fear that would hardly ever leave her for every month at the full moon whether she would or no she found herself driven to the maze through its mysterious walks into that strange dancing-room and when she was there the music began once more and once more she danced most deliciously for the moon to see the second time that this happened she merely thought that it was a reoccurrence of her own whim and that the music was but a trick that the imagination had chosen to repeat the third time frightened her and she knew that the force that sways the tides had strange power over her the fear grew as the year fell for each month the music went on for a longer time each month some of the pleasure had gone from the dance on bitter nights in winter the moon called her and she came when the breath was vapor and the trees that circled her dancing-room were black bear skeletons and the frost was cruel she dared not tell anyone and yet it was with difficulty that she kept her secret 
somehow chance seemed to favor her and she always found a way to return from her midnight dance to her own room without being observed each month the summons seemed to be more imperious and urgent once when she was alone on her knees before the lighted altar in the private chapel of the palace she suddenly felt that the words of the familiar latin prayer had gone from her memory she rose to her feet she sobbed bitterly but the call had come and she could not resist it she passed out of the chapel and down the palace gardens how madly she danced that night she was to be married in the spring she began to be more gentle with hugo now she had a blind hope that when they were married she might be able to tell him about it and he might be able to protect her for she had always known him to be fearless she could not love him but she tried to be good to him one day he mentioned to her that he had tried to find his way to the centre of the maze and had failed she smiled faintly if only she could fail but she never did on the night before the wedding day she had gone to bed and slept peacefully thinking with her last waking moments of hugo overhead the full moon came up in the sky quite suddenly viola was wakened with the impulse to fly to the dancing-room it seemed to bid her hasten with breathless speed she flung the cloak about her slipped her naked feet into her dancing shoes and hurried forth no one saw her or heard her on the marble staircase of the palace on down the terraces of the garden she ran as fast as she could a thorn plant caught at her cloak but she sped on tearing it free a sharp stone cut through the satin of one shoe and her foot was wounded and bleeding but she sped on as the pebble that is flung from the cliff must fall until it reaches the sea as the white ghost moth must come in from cool hedges and scented darkness to a burning death in the lamp by which you sit so late so viola had no choice the moon called her the moon drew her to that circle of hard bright sand and the pitiless music it was brilliant rapid music to-night viola threw off her cloak and danced as she did so she saw that a shadow lay over a fragment of the moon's edge it was the night of a total eclipse she heeded it not the intoxication of the dance was on her she was all in white even her face was pale in the moonlight every movement was full of poetry and grace the music would not stop she had grown deathly weary it seemed to her that she had been dancing for hours and the shadow had nearly covered the moon's face so that it was almost dark she could hardly see the trees around her she went on dancing stepping spinning pirouetting held by the merciless music it stopped at last just when the shadow had quite covered the moon's face and all was dark but it stopped only for a moment and then began again this time it was a slow passionate waltz it was useless to resist she began to dance once more as she did so she uttered a sudden shrill scream of horror for in the dead darkness a hot hand had caught her own and whirled her around and she was no longer dancing alone the search for the missing princess lasted during the whole of the following day in the evening prince hugo his face anxious and firmly set passed in his search the iron gate of the maze and noticed on the stones beside it the stain of a drop of blood within the gate was another stain he followed this clue which had been left by viola's wounded foot until he reached that open space in the centre that had served viola for her dancing-room it was quite empty he noticed that the sand round the edges was all worn down as though some one had danced there round and round for a long time but no separate footprint was distinguishable there just outside this track however he saw two footprints clearly defined close together one was the print of a tiny satin shoe the other was a print of a large naked foot a cloven foot End of chapter three Section four of Stories in the Dark. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Kate Fallis. Stories in the Dark by Barry Payne. The Green Light. The man looked down at the figure of the woman on the couch. The little silver clock on the mantelpiece began to chime. He could not bear the sound of it. He flew at the clock like a madman and dashed it on the ground and stamped on it. Then he drew down the blind and opened the door and listened. There was no one on the staircase. Silence seemed now as intolerable to him as sound had been a moment before. He tried to whistle, but his lips were too dry and made only a ridiculous hissing sound. Closing the door behind him, he ran down the staircase and out into the street. The woman on the couch never moved or spoke. It was late in the afternoon. The light from the low sun penetrated the green blind and took from it a horrible color that seemed to tint the face of the woman on the couch. Flies came out of the dark corners of the room, sulkily busy, crawling and buzzing. One very little fly passed backwards and forwards over the woman's white-ringed hand. It moved rapidly, a black speck. Outside in the street the man stepped from the pavement into the roadway. A cabman shouted and swore at him, and someone dragged him back by the arm and told him roughly to look where he was going. He stood still for a minute and rubbed his forehead with his hand. This would not do. The critical moment had come, the moment when, above all things, it was necessary that his nerve should be perfect and his thoughts clear, and now, when he tried to think, a picture came before the thought and filled his mind. The picture of the white face with the green light upon it, and his heart was beating too fast, and it seemed to him almost audibly. He began to feel his pulse counting the strokes out loud as he stood on the curb. Then he was conscious that two or three boys and loafers were standing in a little group, watching him and laughing at him. One of the loafers handed him his hat. It had fallen off when he dodged back on to the pavement, and he had not noticed it. He took the hat and felt for some coins to give the man. He found a half-crown and a half-penny. He held them in his hand and stared at them and forgot why he had wanted them. Then he suddenly remembered and gave them. There was a loud yell of laughter. The boys and loafers were running away, and he heard one of them shouting, Let the old stinker out a bit too soon, ain't they? And another, Garu, ace tight, that's all's wrong with him. Again he told himself that this would not do. He must not think of the past, the awful past. He must not think of the future, of his schemes for escape. He must concentrate his thoughts on the present moment, until he could get to some place where he could be alone. Yes, Regent's Park would do well, and it was near. He brushed his hat with his coat sleeve, put it on, and walked. He thought about the movement of his feet, and the best way to cross the road, and how to avoid running into people, and how to behave as other people in the street behaved, all the things that one generally does unconsciously and automatically required now for their conduct a distinct mental effort. As he walked on, his mind seemed to clear a little. He reached a spot in Regent's Park where he could lie down in the grass, with no one near him, out of sight. Now, he said to himself, I need concentrate my thoughts no longer. I can let them go. In a second he had gone rapidly through the past, the jealousy that had burned in his heart, and the way that he had quieted himself and made his scheme and carried it out slowly. It had been finished that afternoon, when he had lost control over himself, and, through the transparent leaves of the tree near him, the sun came with a greenish glare. He shuddered and turned away, so that he could not see it. Yes, he was to escape. He had made all the arrangements for that. He drew from his side pocket a roll of notes, and counted them, and entered the numbers in his pocket-book. 
he had changed a check for fifty pounds at the bank that morning the police would find that out and endeavour to trace him by discovering where the notes with those numbers were changed that was one of his means of escape he would see to it that the notes were never changed by himself or in any town where he had been or was likely to be he was going to sacrifice those ten banknotes to put the police on a wrong scent he had plenty of money ready in gold in gold that could not be traced for his own needs he chuckled to himself it was brilliant this scheme for providing a wrong scent for making the very carefulness and astuteness of the detectives the stumbling block in their way and it would be so easy to get the notes changed by others the dishonesty of ordinary human beings would serve his purpose his mood had changed now to one of exultation he told himself time after time that he was right the law would condemn him but morally he was right and had only punished the woman as she deserved to be punished only he must escape and yes he must not forget he looked round there was still no one near but his position did not satisfy him not a person must see what he was going to do next he went on and found a spot near the canal where he seemed to be out of sight and more secure from interruption then he took from his pocket a little looking-glass and a pair of scissors very carefully he cut away his beard and moustache that hid the thin-lipped wide mouth and the small weak chin he cut as close as he could and when he had finished he looked like a man who had neglected to shave for a day or two a barber would shave him now without suspicion he was satisfied with the operation the glass showed him a face so changed that it startled him to look at it he glanced at his watch it was time to start for the station where his luggage had been waiting since the day before if he meant to get shaved on the way there he walked a little way and sat down again how well everything has been thought out he said to himself with a new name and in another country without that drunken faithless beautiful woman he would grow happy again he had only meant to sit down for a minute or two but his thoughts rambled and became nonsense and suddenly he fell into a deep sleep he had been overtaxed an hour passed the train that he had intended to take steamed out of the station and still he slept it grew dusk and still he slept when the park keeper touched him on the shoulder he half woke and spoke querulously then consciousness came back and slowly he realized what had happened as he walked slowly out of the park his mind refreshed with sleep he for the first time realized something else in the awful moment when he had left the woman he had broken down and forgotten everything the bag of gold was still lying on the table of the room with the green blind he must go back and get it it would be horrible to re-enter that room but it could not be helped he dared not change the notes himself and in any case that amount would be insufficient he must have the gold it added he told himself slightly to the risk of discovery but only slightly his servants had all been sent out and were not to return until half-past nine no one else could have entered the house he would find everything as he left it the gold on the table and the figure of the woman on the couch he would let himself in with his latch-key no passer-by would take any notice of so ordinary an incident he had no occasion to hurry now and he turned into the first barber's shop that he saw his mind was as alert now as it had been when he first formed his scheme let me have your best razor he said my skin's tender in fact for the last two or three days i haven't been able to shave at all he chatted with the barber about horse racing and said that he himself had a couple of horses in training 
then he inquired the way to piccadilly saying that he was a stranger in london and seemed to take careful note of the barber's directions he walked briskly away from the shop towards his own house a comfortable-looking ruddy-faced woman was coming towards him a shaft of green light from a chemist's shop window fell full on her face as she passed and the horror came back upon him it was with difficulty that he checked himself from crying out he hurried on but that hideous light seemed to linger in his eyes and to haunt him keep quiet he kept saying to himself under his breath steady yourself don't be a fool there was an italian restaurant near and he went in and drank a couple of glasses of cognac then only was he able to go on as he turned the corner where his house came into sight he looked up all the house was dark but for one great green eye in the centre that looked at him there were lights in that room he stood still close to a lamp-post just touching it to keep his balance he spoke to himself aloud. It's green. It's green. Someone's there. A working man passed him, heard him mumbling, looked at him curiously, and went on. The great green eye stared at him and fascinated him. Then other lights darted about, red lights, white lights. Someone must be going up and down the staircase and passages. Had she got off the couch? Was the dead woman walking? how his head throbbed there were two nerves that seemed to sound like two consecutive notes on a piano struck in slow alternation then quickening to a rapid shake whirr whirr now the two notes were struck together a repeated discord thumped out clatter clatter no the sound was outside in the street and it was the sound of people running there were boys with excited eyes and white faces and blousy laughing women and a little old ferret-faced man who coughed as he ran a police whistle screamed in front of the door of the house a black mass grew up getting quickly bigger and bigger it was a crowd of people swaying backwards and forwards kept back by the police the police he was discovered then he must get away at once not wait another moment only the green light was looking at him stop that light he called no one noticed him the green light went on glimmering and drew him nearer he had to get there he was on the outskirts of the crowd now why would not the crowd let him pass could not they hear that he was being called he pushed his way struggling dragging people on one side there were angry voices a hum growing louder and louder he caught a woman by the neck and flung her aside she screamed someone struck him in the face and he tried to strike back down he was down on the road the air was stifling and stinking there he tried to get up and was forced back ha ah, now he was up again his coat torn off his back muddy bleeding fighting spitting howling like a madman damn you damn you all the crowd was a storm all round him tossing him here and there again and again he was struck there was blood streaming over his eyes and through the blood and mingled with blood he saw the green light looking there came a sudden lull a couple of policemen stood by him and one of them had him by the arm and asked him what he was doing he began to cry sobbing like a child take me up there he said panting where the green light is it's the dead woman calling the policeman stood for a moment hesitating for a moment the crowd was motionless and silent then one of those white-faced boys shrank further back whispering it's the man end of section four
Section five of Stories in the Dark. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. Stories in the Dark by Barry Payne. The Magnet. Subsequent to the inquest on the body of the Reverend Ingram Shallow, who shot himself in the churchyard of St. John's Ilworthy, Bedfordshire, on the evening of October 14th. The following paper was found at his lodgings in the village, and is here published for the first time. It will be remembered that at the inquest the usual verdict of temporary insanity was returned. Thursday, October 6th the world is still ringing with the news of the ghastly accident to the express the night before last the times has a column and a half nothing else is spoken of in the village yesterday afternoon i went over on my bicycle to witness the scene of the accident of course the more horrible traces of it had already been removed the screams of the injured and dying and the sight of mangled bodies about which we read in the papers would have been too much for me the up line was already clear and it was expected the down line would also be clear in the course of a couple of hours there was a perfect army of men at work with every kind of ingenious contrivance for removing the heavy obstacles all along the embankment fragments of the debris are still strewn at a distance of at least forty yards from the point where the accident actually happened I found, among some wet grass and fern, a part of one of those plates they have up in the carriages, giving the number that the carriage is intended to carry. I have often noticed, when standing in the station, the appearance of strength which locomotives and carriages on the fast trains always have. Yet here one saw all this strength of no avail. The engine and the carriages were broken up, just like a child's toys. I do most sincerely hope and believe that it was nobody in the Illworthy who was responsible for the disaster. Whoever it is, I do trust and pray that he may be discovered, and that he may pay with his own life for the lives of those hundreds his fiendish action has sent, without a moment of warning, into eternity. Friday, October 7th. The vicar came back with me to breakfast this morning after the early service. After some talk about the accident, I asked him if he intended to touch upon it on Sunday morning. He said that he would, if I thought it necessary, but that his sermon was already written, being one of a series on the Gospels for the day, which he prepared some time ago. I said that undoubtedly the accident was a terrible event, and one which had sunk very deeply into the minds of everybody in Ilworthy. It was an event which might give point and weight to many a lesson, and it had been my view that Christianity was a practical religion, and the priest should, whenever possible, bring it to bear upon the events of the day. At the same time I did not insist. It was not for me to instruct him. The contrary was rather the case. He smiled good-temperedly, and said that since I seemed to be so full of the accident, and had taken such an absorbing interest in it, I could probably preach a better sermon on it myself, and I might use that as my subject for Sunday evening. I thanked him, and said that I would do so. I have spent the whole day over this sermon. I do not, like the vicar, read my sermons, but I have written this out in full, and shall commit it to memory. I have given what I think is really a somewhat vivid and impressive picture of the great express rushing at headlong speed to ruin, the obstacle just seen by the driver one moment before his engine crashed into it, the sudden darkness of the train through the extinction of the lights, the screams for help, the sight of the dead bodies laid out on the embankment. I have worked myself up so much about this sermon that I have only to shut my eyes actually to witness the scene myself. 
i seemed to be standing by the obstruction and to see the long train crashing down upon me when it is too late to do anything i hope i am not exciting myself too much about it it is already past ten and i think i shall have a cup of hot cocoa quietly and go to bed i notice that one of the illustrated papers in the reading-room has a magnificent full-page illustration of the accident i have often thought by the way of writing a little for the papers myself i know i have some taste for the work and i am inclined to think i have some little gift also the supplement to one's income would be useful sunday october ninth i have just returned from church exhausted i preached over forty minutes without the least sign of impatience from any of the congregation no coughing or shuffling of the feet or anything of the kind in the vestry afterwards mr johnson our senior churchwarden took me aside and told me that it was one of the strongest and most impressive addresses he had ever heard delivered from that pulpit i hope i did not appear to be unduly pleased at this one must not think of self in these matters and i strive against it i was a little surprised that after this special effort of mine the vicar should have said nothing at all he is not a small-minded man and i cannot believe him to be actuated by jealousy he spoke of the accident again and said in what seemed to be rather a patronizing way that he was afraid i was letting it prey too much on my mind i tried to be humble and i think i can submit to a rebuke when it is deserved but really this is nonsense i still picture to myself at times the man standing by the obstruction and watching the express coming towards him but for the awful wickedness of it it would be in a way a magnificent moment he would have the thought that he a weak man could at his will check the rush of a train hurl it over twist and break the strong iron as if it were cardboard and avenge himself on hundreds of people and then have all the police in the country hunting for him and in vain exhausted though i am i am afraid that i shall get no sleep to-night until i have been out in the fresh air a little the church was crowded and oppressively hot the whole village is asleep and no one will be any the wiser i think i will get on my bicycle and ride down again to the place where the accident happened it is within a quarter of an hour to midnight and so sunday is practically over besides there are many very good men who do not consider that cycling on sunday is wrong monday october tenth to-day i have been beset by a terrible and most extraordinary temptation i thank god that i have wrestled against it successfully but the fact that such a temptation could even occur to me appalls me tuesday october eleventh the vicar called this morning he will take both sermons next sunday he said that i looked ill and that he thought i had been overdoing it and was in want of a holiday i think he is right he is really a very kind man i shall go away next week again all day long i have been subject to the same diabolical impulse i was half tempted to speak to the vicar about it but shame prevented me i get but little sleep now at nights and if i do sleep i am always haunted by the same dream i see the lights of the express coming nearer and nearer wednesday october twelfth it is done now it had to be done and it was no good to contend against it i believe that it must have been the will of god that i should do it for ever since the burden has been lifted from my mind and i have been quite myself again late last night or rather very early this morning finding myself unable to sleep i got up and went out i did not take my bicycle i ran all the way to that point on the line that i have always been thinking about there is a stack of heavy sleepers there 
it is at the bottom of a deep cutting and you can see the train coming for some distance i knew by the tables that i had not much time to spare i had got six of the heavy sleepers across the rails when i thought i heard it coming but i was mistaken i dragged on another and then i heard the roar there was no mistake about it i could see the lights flashing as i saw them in my dream i am ashamed that i had not the strength of mind to wait until the last moment i tried to but i could not i ran away up the embankment and crossed some fields i saw some men coming and hid behind a hedge i knew that detectives were about i lay there panting and was afraid they would hear me but they passed on i got back to my lodgings while it was still dark nobody had heard me go out and nobody heard me come back that is all right since writing the above i have been to the wednesday evening service the vicar was to deliver an address at the last moment i felt that i wished to preach on this awful accident and the lessons it must have for every one of us i crossed over to the vicar and asked permission to preach he refused i warned him that i intended to preach and that if he attempted to occupy the pulpit he would do so at his peril then i suddenly seemed to see the matter in a different light and apologized to him however i wish very much to address the village on the subject and as i am not allowed to preach in church i shall call a public meeting at the recreation ground i must remember to get arrangements made as to the printing and posting of bills to-morrow end of section five Section 6 of Stories in the Dark. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Nosetti. DavidNosetti.com. Stories in the Dark by Barry Payne. The Case of Vincent Pierwit. The death of Vincent Pierwit, J.P., of Eldon House, Eldon, in the county of Buckingham, would, in the ordinary way, have received no more attention than the death of any other simple country gentleman. The circumstances of his death, however, though now long since forgotten, were sensational, and attracted some notice at the time. It was one of those cases which is easily forgotten within a year, except just in the locality where it occurred the most sensational circumstances of the case never came before the public at all i give them here simply and plainly the psychical people may make what they like of them pirwit himself was a very ordinary country gentleman a good fellow but in no way brilliant he was devoted to his wife who was some fifteen years younger than himself and remarkably beautiful she was quite a good woman but she had her faults she was fond of admiration and she was an abominable flirt she misled men very cleverly and was then sincerely angry with them for having been misled her husband never troubled his head about these flirtations being assured quite rightly that she was a good woman he was not jealous she on the other hand was possessed of a jealousy amounting almost to insanity this might have caused trouble if he had ever provided her with the slightest basis on which her jealousy could work but he never did with the exception of his wife women bored him i believe she did once or twice try to make a scene for some preposterous reason which was no reason at all but nothing serious came of it and there was never a real quarrel between them on the death of his wife after a prolonged illness pirwit wrote and asked me to come down to elidon for the funeral and to remain at least a few days with him he would be quite alone and i was his oldest friend i hate attending funerals but i was his oldest friend and i was moreover a distant relation to his wife 
I had no choice and went down. There were many visitors in the house for the funeral, which took place in the village churchyard, but they left immediately afterwards. The air of heavy gloom which had hung over the house seemed to lift a little. The servants, servants are always very emotional, continued to break down at intervals. Noticeably, Pirwit's man, Williams, but Pirwit himself was self-possessed. He spoke of his wife with great affection and regret, but still he could speak of her, and not unsteadily. At dinner he also spoke of one or two other subjects, of politics and of his duties as a magistrate, and of course he made the requisite fuss about his gratitude to me for coming down to Ellerdon at that time. After dinner we sat in the library, a room well and expensively furnished, but without the least attempt at taste. There were a few oil paintings on the walls, a presentation portrait of himself, and a landscape or two, all more or less bad, as far as I remember. He had eaten next to nothing at dinner, but he had drunk a good deal. The wine, however, did not seem to have the least effect upon him. I had got the conversation definitely off the subject of his wife when I made a blunder. I noticed an Ericsson's extension standing on his writing-table. I said, I didn't know that telephones had penetrated into the villages yet. Yes, he said. I had that one fitted up during my wife's illness to communicate with her bedroom on the floor above us on the other side of the house. At that moment the bell of the telephone rang sharply. We both looked at each other. I said with a stupid affectation of calmness one always puts on when one is a little bit frightened, Probably a servant in that room wishes to speak with you. He got up, walked over to the machine, and swung the green cord towards me. The end of it was loose. I had it disconnected this morning, he said. Also, the door of that room is locked, and no one could possibly be in it. He had turned the colour of grey blotting paper. So, probably, had I. The bell rang again, a prolonged rattling ring. Are you going to answer it? I said. I am not, he answered firmly. Then, I said, I shall answer it myself. It is some stupid trick, a joke not in the best of taste, for which you will probably have to sack one or the other of your domestics. My servants, he answered, would not have done that. Besides, don't you see it is impossible? The instrument is disconnected. The bell rang all the same. I shall try it. I picked up the receiver. Are you there? I called. The voice which answered me was unmistakably the rather high staccato voice of Mrs. Pirwit. I want you, it said, to tell my husband that he will be with me to-morrow. I still listened. Nothing more was said. I repeated, Are you there? And still there was no answer. I turned to Pirwit. There is no one there, I said. Possibly there is thunder in the air affecting the bell in some mysterious way. There must be some simple explanation, and I'll find it all out to-morrow. He went to bed early that night. All the following day I was with him. We rode together, and I expected an accident every minute, but none happened. All the evening I expected him to turn suddenly faint and ill, but that also did not happen. When at about ten o'clock he excused himself and said good-night, I felt distinctly relieved. He went up to his room and rang for Williams. The rest is, of course, well known. The servant's reason had broken down, possibly the immediate cause being the death of Mrs. Pirwit. On entering his master's room, without the least hesitation, he raised a loaded revolver which he carried in his hand, and shot Pirwit through the heart. 
I believe the case is mentioned in some of the textbooks on homicidal mania. End of section six. Recording by David Nosetti. David Nosetti dot com. Section seven of Stories in the Dark. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenevere. Stories in the Dark by Barry Payne. The Bottom of the Gulf. Three hundred and sixty-two years before Christ, a chasm opened in the Roman Forum and the soothsayers declared that it would never close until the most precious treasure of Rome had been thrown into it. It is said that a youth named Metus, or Metius, Curtius, appeared on horseback in full armor, and before a very fair audience, exclaiming that Rome had no dearer possession than arms and courage, leaped down into the gulf, which thereupon closed over him. This incident, like most of the legendary history of Rome, has been subjected to severe criticism. Those who too hastily disbelieve in it will reconsider their opinion on reading the account, not previously published, of what took place at the bottom of the gulf. Curtius and the horse fell in the order in which they had started, with the horse underneath. After a few minutes' rapid passage, the horse stopped falling somewhat suddenly, broke most of itself, and died. Curtius, who, though a little shaken, was uninjured, sat up on his dead horse and looked round to see if he could discover the nearest way back. As he looked upward, he saw the top edges of the cavern close together, and the daylight shut out. But a curious greenish light still lingered in the cavern in which he found himself, and from one of its recesses came a voice which startled Medius considerably. It said, interrogatively, Did you hurt yourself? Not much, replied Curtius. I didn't know there was anybody down here. You quite startled me. Do come out and let me see you. No, thanks said the voice. Did you really believe that you would die when you jumped down the gulf? Certainly I did. The voice laughed a mean little snigger. <laughs> so you will, too. You'll die of suffocation slowly, when the air in this cavern is exhausted. Then we'd better get to work at once, said Curtius. I have an excellent sword here and a couple of daggers. I put them on for the occasion. I didn't fall so far as I expected, and if we both of us work hard, we shall be able to cut our way out. Thanks, said the voice, but I am not going to do any work. I am not of the same kind as yourself. I don't need the air of the outer world. In fact, I don't think much of the outer world, even its best specimens. That's why I live down here. You've got to die. Sorry, but there's no help for it. I've set my trap, and I caught you, and, if you're the best specimen they can provide on top, my low opinion of them is confirmed. What do you mean by trap? asked Curtius. Well, it was I who caused the chasm to open, knowing the kind of tomfool thing your soothsayers would remark about it. I sat here wondering what I should get. Shouldn't have been surprised at a brace of bestial virgins. They would have exclaimed, Purity and devotion, instead of courage and arms, amid loud applause, of course. Or it might have been an elderly matron, with a good old tag that Rome held nothing more precious than the tender love of her mothers. It might have been a soothsayer. It might have been anything. As it is, it's you. And I think very little of you. Arms? 
Of what use do you think all those tin pot arrangements which you have hung about you are likely to be? Courage? Why, man alive, you've got no courage at all. I have, said Curtius stolidly. I fully expected to die, and I was willing to die. Just for one moment, said the voice. When you had got all that mob of howling fools around applauding you, applause is an intoxicant, and you got drunk on it. Now you are sober again, and you don't want to die at all. The man who can die alone, slowly and terribly, is courageous. But you've got no more courage in you than a piece of chewed string. You're as white as chalk. That's the effect of the green light, interposed Curtius. Rubbish, replied the voice. Green light doesn't make a man shake all over, does it? That's just the shock from the fall, said Curtius. But I can't stop here arguing with you. I'm off to explore the cavern. There must be a way out somewhere. There isn't said the voice. But you can explore. I can't die like a rat in a trap, said Curtius, whimpering. And off he went on his exploration. He looked in at the recess from which the voice had proceeded and found nothing. The cave was enormous. For many hours he tramped on and on, and never through one tiny chink in the roof did he see the light of day. Exhausted and ravenous at last, he flung himself down on the floor of the cave, and almost immediately the voice, which had been silent all this time, began anew. First of all came that faint, mean little snicker. Then it said, <laughs> Hungry? Worn out with hunger, sobbed Curtius. I'm thirsty, too. My mouth is so parched that I can hardly speak, and there doesn't seem to be one drop of moisture in this damned cavern. There isn't, said the voice, nor one crumb of food, either, with the exception of your horse, and I don't think you will be able to find that again. You can try back if you like. Now I come to think of it, you won't die of suffocation, but of starvation. Cuts my entertainment rather shorter than I had hoped, but I must put up with that. I can't die like this, sobbed Curtius. Courage and arms, replied the voice, are the things which Rome holds most precious. Go on, my boy. You'll last some time yet. Then Curtius drew his sword and went to look for the proprietor of the voice in order to slay him. But he didn't find him. He resumed his explorations. In a few hours he was too weak to walk any further. He fell into a kind of doze, and when he woke again his arms had been taken from him. Where is my sword? he exclaimed. I've got it, replied the voice, this time from the roof of the cavern. What do you want it for? Want to kill myself, said Curtius. If I give you your sword, will you own that you were merely a drunken theatrical impostor? Yes. And that you are a coward and are dying the death of a coward? Yes. The sword clattered down from the roof on to the floor of the cavern at the feet of the hero. He picked it up and set his teeth. End of Section 7 Section 8 of Stories in the Dark This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Dahlman. Stories in the Dark by Barry Payne. The End of a Show 
It was a little village in the extreme north of Yorkshire, three miles from a railway station on a small branch line. It was not a progressive village. It just kept still and respected itself. The hills lay all around it and seemed to shut it out from the rest of the world. Yet folks were born and lived and died, much as in the more important centers, and there were intervals which required to be filled with amusement. Entertainments were given by amateurs from time to time in the schoolroom. Sometimes handbell ringers or a conjurer would visit the place, but their reception was not always encouraging. Conjurers is not, and ringers is not, said the sad native judiciously. Our don't regard em. But the native brightened up when in the summer months a few caravans found their way to a piece of wasteland adjoining the churchyard. They formed the village fair, and for two days they were a popular resort. But it was understood that the fair had not the glories of the old days. It had dwindled. Most things in connection with this village dwindled. The first day of the fair was drawing to a close. It was half-past ten at night, and at eleven the fair would close until the following morning. This last half-hour was fruitful in business. The steam roundabout was crowded. The proprietor of the peep-show was taking pennies very fast, although not so fast as the proprietor of another somewhat repulsive show. A fair number patronized a canvas booth which bore the following inscription popular science lectures a mission free at one end of this tent was a table covered with red baize on it were bottles and boxes a human skull a retort a large book and some bundles of dried herbs behind it was the lecturer an old man gray and thin wearing a bright colored dressing gown he lectured volubly and enthusiastically. His energy in the atmosphere of the tent made him very hot, and occasionally he mopped his forehead. I am about to exhibit to you, he said, speaking clearly and correctly, a secret known to few, and believed to have come originally from those wise men of the East referred to in Holy Writ. Here he filled two test tubes with water and placed some bluish green crystals in one and some yellow crystals in the other. He went on talking, quoting scraps of Latin, telling stories, making local and personal allusions, finally coming back again to his two test tubes, both which now contained almost colorless solutions. He poured them both together into a flat glass vessel, and the mixture at once turned into a deep brownish purple. He threw a fragment of something onto the surface of the mixture, and that fragment at once caught fire. This favorite trick succeeded. The audience were undoubtedly impressed, and before they quite realized by what logical connection the old man had arrived at the subject, he was talking to them about the abdomen. He seemed to know the most unspeakable and intimate things about the abdomen. He had made pills which suited its peculiar needs, which he could and would sell in boxes at sixpence and one shilling, according to size. He sold four boxes at once, and was back to his classical and anecdotal stage when a woman pressed forward. She was a very poor woman. Could she have a box of these pills at half price? Her son was bad, very bad. It would be a kindness. He interrupted her in a dry, distinct voice. Woman, I never yet did any one a kindness, not even myself. However, a friend pushed some money into her hand, and she bought two boxes. It was past twelve o'clock now. The flaring lights were out in the little group of caravans on the waste ground. The tired proprietors of the shows were asleep. The gravestones in the churchyard were glimmering white in the bright moonlight. But at the entrance to that little canvas booth, the quack doctor sat on one of his boxes smoking a clay pipe. He had taken off his dressing gown and was in his shirt sleeves. His clothes were black, much worn. His attention was arrested. He thought that he heard the sound of sobbing. It's a God-forsaken world, he said aloud. After a second silence, he spoke again. No, I never did a kindness even to myself, though I thought I did, or I shouldn't have come to this. He took his pipe from his mouth and spat. Once more he heard that strange wailing sound. This time he arose and walked in the direction of it. Yes, that was it. It came from that caravan standing alone where the trees made a dark spot. The caravan was gaudily painted, and there were steps from the door to the ground. 
he remembered having noticed it once during the day it was evident that someone inside was in trouble great trouble the old man knocked gently at the door who's there what's the matter nothing said a broken voice from within are you a woman there was a fearful laugh neither man nor woman a show what do you mean go round to the side and you'll see the old man went round and by the light of two wax matches caught a glimpse of part of the rough painting on the side of the caravan the matches dropped from his hand he came back and sat down on the steps of the caravan you're not like that he said no worse i'm not dressed in pretty clothes and lying on a crimson velvet couch i'm half naked in a corner of this cursed box and crying because my owner beat me now go or i'll open the door and show myself to you as i am now it would frighten you it would haunt your sleep nothing frightens me i was a fool once but i have never been frightened what right has this owner over you he's my father the voice screamed loudly then there was more weeping then it spoke again it's awful i could bear anything now anything if i thought it would ever be any better but it won't my mind's a woman's and my wants are a woman's but i am not a woman i am a show the brutes stand round me talk to me touch me there's a way out said the old man quietly after a pause an idea had occurred to him i know and i daren't take it i've got a thing here but i daren't use it you could drink something something that wouldn't hurt yes are you quite alone yes my owner is in the village at the inn then wait a minute the old man hastened back to the canvas booth and fumbled about with his chemicals he murmured something about doing someone a kindness at last then he returned to the caravan with a glass of colorless liquid in his hand open the door and take it he said the door was open a very little way a thin hand was thrust out and took the glass eagerly the door closed and the voice spoke again it will be easy yes good-bye then to your health the old man heard the glass crash on the wooden floor then he went back to his seat in front of the booth and carefully lit another pipe i will not go he said aloud i fear nothing not even the results of my best action he listened attentively no sound whatever came from the caravan all was still far away the sky was growing lighter with the dawn of a fine summer day end of section eight Section 9 of Stories in the Dark. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dan Grzynski. Stories in the Dark by Barry Payne. The Undying Thing. 1. Up and down the oak paneled dining hall of Mansta. The master of the house walked restlessly. At formal intervals down the long, severe table were placed four silver candlesticks, but the light from these did not serve to illuminate the whole of the surroundings. It just touched the portrait of a fair-haired boy with a sad and wistful expression that hung at one end of the room. It sparkled on the lid of a silver tankard. As Sir Edric passed to and fro, it lit up his face and figure. It was a bold and resolute face, with a firm chin and passionate, dominant eyes. A bad past was written in the lines of it. And yet every now and then there came over it a strange look of very anxious gentleness that gave it some resemblance to the portrait of the fair-haired boy. Sir Edric paused a moment before the portrait and surveyed it carefully. His strong brown hands locked behind him, his gigantic shoulders thrust a little forward. "'Ah, what I was,' he murmured to himself, "'what I was.' 
Once more he commenced pacing up and down. The candles mirrored in the polished wood of the table had burnt low. For hours Sir Edric had been waiting, listening intently for some sound from the room above or from the broad staircase outside. There had been sounds, the wailing of a woman, a quick abrupt voice, the moving of rapid feet, but for the last hour he had heard nothing. Quite suddenly he stopped and dropped on his knees against the table. God, I have never thought of thee. Thou knowest that. Thou knowest that by my devilish behavior and cruelty I did veritably murder Alice, my first wife, albeit the physicians did maintain that she died of a decline, a wasting sickness. Thou knowest that all here in man's death do hate me, and that rightly. They say, too, that I am mad, but that they say not rightly, seeing that I know how wicked I am. I always knew it. But I never cared until I loved. Oh, God, I never cared. His fierce eyes opened for a minute, glared round the room, and closed again tightly. He went on. God, for myself I ask nothing. I make no bargaining with thee. Whatsoever punishment thou givest me to bear, I will bear it. Whatsoever thou givest me to do, I will do it. Whether thou killest Eve, or whether thou keepest her in life, and never have I loved but her, I will, from this night, be good. In due penitence will I receive the holy sacrament of thy body and blood, and my son, the one child that I had by Alice, I will fetch back again from Chalensee, where I kept him in order that I might not look upon him, and I will be to him a father indeed and very truth, and in all things, so far as in me lieth, I will make restitution and atonement, whether thou hearest me or whether thou hearest me not, these things shall be, and for my prayer it is but this, of thy loving kindness, most merciful God, be thou with Eve and make her happy. And after these great pains and perils of childbirth, send her thy peace of thy loving kindness, thy merciful loving kindness, O God. Perhaps the prayer that is offered when the time for praying is over is more terribly pathetic than any other, yet one might hesitate to say that this prayer was unanswered. Sir Edric rose to his feet. Once more he paced the room. There was a strange simplicity about him, the simplicity that scorns an incongruity. He felt that his lips and throat were parched and dry. He lifted the heavy silver tankard from the table and raised the lid. There was still a good draught of mulled wine in it, with the burnt toast cut heart-shaped floating on the top. To the health of Eve and her child, he said aloud, and drained it to the last drop. Click, click. As he put the tankard down, he heard distinctly two doors opened and shut quickly, one after the other, and then slowly down the stairs came a hesitating step. Sir Edric could bear the suspense no longer. He opened the dining-room door, and the dim light strayed out into the dark hall beyond. "'Denison!' he said in a low, sharp whisper. "'Is that you?' "'Yes, yes, I am coming, Sir Edric.' A moment afterwards Dr. Dennison entered the room. He was very pale. Perspiration streamed from his forehead. His cravat was disarranged. He was an old man, thin, with the air of proud humility. Sir Edric watched him narrowly. "'Then she is dead,' he said, with a quiet that Dr. Dennison had not expected. Twenty physicians, a hundred physicians, could not have saved her. Sir Edric, she was, he gave some details of medical interest. Dennison, said Sir Edric, still speaking with common restraint, why do you seem thus indisposed and panic-stricken? You are a physician. Have you never looked upon the face of death before? The soul of my wife is with God. Yes, murmured Dennison, a good woman, a perfect, saintly woman. And, Sir Edric went on, 
raising his eyes to the ceiling as though he could see through it her body lies in great dignity and beauty upon the bed and there is no horror in it why are you afraid i do not fear death sir edric but your hands they are not steady you are evidently overcome does the child live yes it lives another boy a brother for young edric the child that alice bore me there there is something wrong i do not know what to do i want you to come upstairs and sir edric i must tell you you will need your self-command denison the hand of god is heavy upon me but from this time forth until the day of my death i am submissive to it and god send that that day may come quickly i will follow you and i will endure he took one of the high silver candlesticks from the table and stepped towards the door. He strode quickly up the staircase, Dr. Dennison following a little way behind him. As Sir Edric waited at the top of the staircase, he heard suddenly from the room before him a low cry. He put down the candlestick on the floor and leaned back against the wall, listening. The cry came again, a vibrating monotone ending in a growl. Dennison? Dennison? His voice choked. He could not go on. Yes, said the doctor. It is in there. I had the two women out of the room and got it here. No one but myself has seen it, but you must see it too. He raised the candle, and the two men entered the room, one of the spare bedrooms. On the bed there was something moving under the cover of a blanket. Dr. Dennison paused for a moment and then flung the blanket partially back. They did not remain in the room for more than a few seconds. The moment they got outside, Dr. Dennison began to speak. Sir Edric, I would fain suggest somewhat to you. There is no evil as Sophocles hath it in his antigone for which man hath not found a remedy except it be death and here sir edric interrupted him in a husky voice downstairs denison this is too near it was indeed passing strange when once the novelty of this occurrence had worn off dr denison seemed no longer frightened he was calm academic interested in an unusual phenomenon but sir edric who was said in the village to fear nothing in earth or in heaven or hell was obviously much moved when they had got back to the dining room sir edric motioned the doctor to a seat now then he said i will hear you something must be done and tonight exceptional cases said dr dennison demand exceptional remedies well it lies there upstairs and is at our mercy we can let it live or placing one hand over the mouth and nostrils we can stop said sir edric this thing has so crushed and humiliated me that i can scarcely think but i recall that while i waited for you i fell upon my knees and prayed that god would save eve and as i confessed unto him more than i will ever confess unto man it seemed to me that it were ignoble to offer a price for his favor and i said that whatsoever punishment i had to bear i would bear it and whatsoever he called upon me to do i would do it and i made no conditions well now my punishment is of two kinds firstly my wife eve is dead and this i bear more easily because i know that now she is numbered with the company of god's saints and with them her pure spirit finds happier communion than with me i was not worthy of her and yet she would call my roughness by gentle pretty names she gloried denison in the mere strength of my body and in the greatness of my stature and i am thankful that she never saw this this shame that has come upon the house for she was a proud woman 
with all her gentleness, even as I was proud and bad until it pleased God this night to break me, even to the dust. And for my second punishment, that too I must bear. This thing that lies upstairs I will take and rear. It is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Only if it be possible I will hide my shame so that no man but you shall know of it. This is not possible. You cannot keep a living being in this house unless it be known. Will not these women say, Where is the child? Sir Edric stood upright, his powerful hands linked before him, his face working in agony, but he was still resolute. Then, if it must be known, it shall be known. The fault is mine. If I had but done sooner what Eve asked, this would not have happened. I will bear it. Sir Edric, do not be angry with me, for if I did not say this, then I should be but an ill counsellor. And firstly, do not use the word shame. The ways of nature are past all explaining. If a woman be frail and easily impressed, and other circumstances concur, then in some few rare cases a thing of this sort does happen. If there be shame, it is not upon you, but upon nature, to whom one would not lightly impute shame. Yet it is true that common and uninformed people might think that this shame was yours, and herein lies the great trouble. The shame would rest also on her memory. Then said Sir Edric, in a low, unfaltering voice, This night, for the sake of Eve, I will break my word, and lose my own soul eternally. About an hour afterwards, Sir Edric and Dr. Dennison left the house together. The doctor carried a stable lantern in his hand. Sir Edric bore in his arms something wrapped in a blanket. They went through the long garden, out into the orchard that skirts the north side of the park, and then across a field to a small dark plantation known as Hal's Planting. In the very heart of Hal's Planting there are some curious caves. Access to the innermost chamber of them is exceedingly difficult and dangerous, and only possible to a climber of exceptional skill and courage. As they return from these caves, Sir Edric no longer carried his burden. The dawn was breaking, and the birds began to sing. "'Could not they be quiet just for this morning?' said Sir Edric wearily. There were but few people who were asked to attend the funeral of Lady Van Crest, and of the baby, which it was said, had only survived her by a few hours. There were but three people who knew that only one body, the body of Lady Van Crest, was really interred in that occasion. These three were Sir Edric Van Crest, Dr. Dennison, and a nurse whom it had been found expedient to take into their confidence. During the next six years Sir Edric lived almost in solitude, a life of great sanctity devoting much of his time to the education of the younger Edric, the child that he had by his first wife. In the course of this time some strange stories began to be told and believed in the neighborhood with reference to Hal's planting, and the place was generally avoided. When Sir Edric lay on his deathbed the windows of the chamber were open, and suddenly through them came a low cry. The doctor in attendance hardly regarded it, supposing that it came from one of the owls in the trees outside. But Sir Edric, at the sound of it, rose right up in bed before anyone could stay him, and flinging up his arms, cried, Wolves! 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 Then he fell forward on his face, dead. And four generations passed away. Two. Towards the latter end of the nineteenth century, John Marsh, who was the oldest man in the village of Mansteth, could be prevailed upon to state what he recollected. His two sons supported him in his old age. He never felt the pinch of poverty, 
and he always had money in his pocket. But it was a settled principle with him that he would not pay for the pint of beer which he drank occasionally in the parlor of the stag. Sometimes Farmer Wyanthwaite paid for the beer. Sometimes it was Mr. Spicer from the post office. Sometimes the landlord of the stag himself would finance the old man's evening dissipation. In return, John Marsh was prevailed upon to state what he recollected. This he would do with great hardiness and strict impartiality, recalling the intemperance of a former Winthwaite and the dishonesty of some ancestral spicer while he drank the beer of their direct descendants. He would tell you, with two tough old fingers crooked round the handle of the pewter, that you had provided, how your grandfather was a poor thing, fit for nought but to break stains by Tarod's side. He was so disrespectful that it was believed that he spoke truth. He was particularly disrespectful when he spoke of that most devilish family, the Van Carests. And he never tired of recounting these stories that from generation to generation had grown up about them. It would be objected sometimes that the present Sir Edric, the last surviving member of the race, was a pleasant-spoken young man, with none of the family wildness and hot temper. It was for no sin of his that Hal's planting was haunted, a thing which every one in Manstead and many beyond it most devoutly believed. John Marsh would hear no apology for him, nor for any of his ancestors. He recounted the prophecy that an old madwoman had made of the family before her strange death, and hoped fervently that he might live to see it fulfilled. The third baronet as has already been told, had lived the latter part of his life after his second wife's death in peace and quietness. Of him John Marsh remembered nothing, of course, and could only recall the few fragments of information that had been handed down to him. He had been told that this Sir Edric, who had traveled a good deal, at one time kept wolves, intending to train them to serve as dogs. These wolves were not kept under proper restraint, and became a kind of terror to the neighborhood. Lady Van Carest, his second wife, had asked him frequently to destroy these beasts, but Sir Edric, although it was said that he loved his second wife even more than he hated the first, a vast obstinate when any of his whims were crossed, and put her off with promises. Then one day Lady Van Carest herself was attacked by the wolves. She was not bitten, but she was badly frightened. That filled Sir Edric with remorse, and when it was too late he went out into the yard where the wolves were kept and shot them all. A few months afterwards Lady Van Carest died in childbirth. It was a queer thing, John Marsh noted, that it was just at this time that Hal's planting began to get such a bad name. The fourth baronet was, John Marsh considered, the worse of the race. It was to him that the old madwoman had made her prophecy, an incident that Marsh himself had witnessed in his childhood and still vividly remembered. The baronet, in his old age, had been cast up by his vices on the shores of melancholy, heavy-eyed, gray-haired, bent, he seemed to pass through life as in a dream. Every day he would go out on horseback, always at a walking pace, as though he were following the funeral of his past self. One night he was riding up the village street, as this old woman came down it. Her name was Anne Ruthers. She had a kind of reputation in the village, and although all said that she was mad, Many of her utterances were remembered, and she was treated with respect. It was growing dark, and the village street was almost empty, but just at the lower end was the usual group of men by the door of the stag, dimly illuminated by the light that came through the quaint windows of the old inn. They glanced at Sir Edric as he rode slowly past them, taking no notice of their respectful salutes. At the upper end of the street there were two persons. One was Anne Ruthers, a tall, gaunt old woman, her head wrapped in a shawl. The other was John Marsh, 
He was then a boy of eight, and he was feeling somewhat frightened. He had been on an expedition to a distant and fetid pond, and in the black mud and clay about its borders he had discovered live newts. He had three of them in his pocket, and this was to some extent a joy to him. But his joy was dampened by his knowledge that he was coming home much too late, and would probably be chastised in consequence. He was unable to walk fast or to run, because Ann Ruthers was immediately in front of him, and he dared not pass her, especially at night. She walked on until she met Sir Edric, and then, standing still, she called him by name. He pulled in his horse and raised his heavy eyes to look at her. Then in loud, clear tones she spoke to him, and John Marsh heard and remembered every word that she said. It was her prophecy of the end of the Van Crests. Sir Edric never answered a word. When she had finished, he rode on, while she remained standing there, her eyes fixed on the stars above her. John Marsh dared not pass the mad woman. He turned round and walked back, keeping close to Sir Edric's horse. Quite suddenly, without a word of warning, as if in a moment of ungovernable irritation, Sir Edric wheeled his horse round and struck the boy across the face with his switch. On the following morning, John Marsh, or rather his parents, received a handsome solatium in coin of the realm, but sixty-five years afterwards he had not forgiven that blow, and still spoke of the Van Crests as a most devilish family, still hoped and prayed that he might see the prophecy fulfilled. He would relate, too, the death of Ann Ruthers, which occurred either later on the night of her prophecy or early on the following day. She would often roam about the country all night, and on this particular night she left the main road to wander over the Van Crest lands, where trespassers, especially at night, were not welcomed. But no one saw her, and it seemed that she made her way to a part where no one was likely to see her, for none of the keepers would have entered Hal's planting by night. Her body was found there at noon on the following day, lying under the tall bracken, dead, but without any mark of violence upon it. It was considered that she had died in a fit. This naturally added to the ill repute of Hal's planting. The woman's death caused considerable sensation in the village. Sir Edric sent a message to the married sister with whom she had lived, saying that he wished to pay all the funeral expenses. This offer, as John Marsh recalled with satisfaction, was refused. Of the last two baronets he had but little to tell. The fifth baronet was credited with the family temper, but he conducted himself in a perfectly conventional way, and did not seem in the least to belong to romance. He was a good man of business, and devoted himself to making up as far as he could for the very extravagant expenditure of his predecessors. His son, the present Sir Edric, was a fine young fellow, and popular in the village. Even John Marsh could find nothing to say against him. Other people in the village were interested in him. It was said that he had chosen a wife in London, a Miss Gurdon, and would shortly be back to see that Mansteth Hall was put in proper order for her before his marriage at the close of the season. Modernity kills ghostly romance. It was difficult to associate this modern and handsome Sir Edric, bright and spirited, a good sportsman and a good fellow, with the doom that had been foretold for the Van Crest family. He himself knew the tradition and laughed at it. He wore clothes made by a London tailor, looked healthy, smiled cheerfully, and in vain attempt to shame his own headkeeper, had himself spent a night alone in Hal's planting. This last was used by Mr. Spicer in argument. Who would ask John Marsh what he had made of it? John Marsh replied contemptuously that it was nout. It was not so that the Van Crest family was to end. But when the thing, whatever it was, that lived in Hal's planting, left it and came up to the house, to Mansteth Hall itself, 
then one would see the end of the vancarists so ann ruthers had prophesied sometimes mr spicer would ask the pertinent question how did john marsh know that there really was anything in hell's planting this he asked less because he disbelieved than because he wished to draw forth an account of john's personal experiences these were given in great detail but they did not amount to very much one night john marsh had been taken by business sir edric keepers would have called the business by hard names into the neighborhood of hal's planting he had there been suddenly startled by a cry and had run away as though he were running for his life that was all he could tell about the cry it was the kind of cry to make a man lose his head and run and then it always happened that john marsh was urged by his companions to enter hell's planting himself and discover what was there john pursed his thin lips together and hinted that that also might be done one of these days whereupon mr spicer looked across his pipe to farmer winthwaite and smiled significantly shortly before sir edric's return from london the attention of mansteth was once more directed to hell's planting but not by any supernatural occurrence quite suddenly on a calm day two trees there fell with a crash there were caves in the centre of the plantation and it seemed as if the roof of some big chamber in these caves had given way they talked it over one night in the parlour of the stag there was water in these caves farmer winthwaite knew it and he expected a further subsidence if the whole thing collapsed what then ay said john marsh he rose from his chair and pointed in the direction of the hall with his thumb what then he walked across to the fire looked at it meditatively for a moment and then spat in it a truly wonderful old man said farmer winthwaite as he watched him end of section nine section ten of stories in the dark this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by dan grzinski stories in the dark by barry payne the undying thing three in the smoking room at mansteth hall sat sir edric with his friend and intended brother-in-law dr andrew garridan both men were on the verge of middle age there was hardly a year's difference between them yet guerdon looked much the older man that was perhaps because he wore a short black beard while sir edric was clean-shaven guerdon was thought to be an enviable man his father had made a fortune in the firm of guerdon guerdon and bird the old style was still retained at the bank although there was no longer a guerdon in the firm andrew guerdon had a handsome allowance from his father and had also inherited money through his mother he had taken the degree of doctor of medicine he did not practice, but he was still interested in science, especially in out-of-the-way science. He was unmarried, gifted with perpetually good health, interested in life, popular. His friendship with Sir Edric dated from their college days. It had for some years been almost certain that Sir Edric would marry his friend's sister, Ray Guerdon, although the actual betrothal had only been announced that season. On a bureau in one corner of the room were spread a couple of plans and various slips of paper. Sir Edric was wrinkling his brows over them, dropping cigar ash over them, and finally getting angry over them. He pushed back his chair irritably and turned towards Guerdon. "'Look here, old man,' he said. "'I desire to curse the original architect of this house, to curse him in his down-sitting and his uprising.' seeing that the original architect has gone to where beyond these voices there is peace he won't be offended neither shall i but why worry yourself you've been rooted in that blessed bureau all day and now after dinner when every self-respecting man shucks business you return to it again even as a sow returns to her wallowing in the mire 
Now, my good Andrew, do be reasonable. How on earth can I bring Ray to such a place as this? And it's built with such ingrained malice and vexatiousness that one can't live in it as it is and can't alter it without having the whole shanty tumble down about one's ears. Look at this plan now. That thing is what they are pleased to call a morning room. If the window had been there, there would have been an interrupted view of open country. So what does this forsaken fool of an architect do? He sticks it there, where you see it on the plan, looking straight on to a blank wall with a stable yard on the other side of it. But that's a trifle. Look here again. I won't look any more. This place is all right. It was good enough for your father and mother, and several generations before them, until you arose to improve the world. It was good enough for you until you started to get married. It's a picturesque place, and if you begin to alter it, you'll spoil it. Gordon looked round the room critically. Upon my word, he said, I don't know of any house where I like the smoking room as well as I like this. It's not too big, and yet it's fairly lofty. It's got those comfortable-looking oak-paneled walls. That's the right kind of fireplace, too, and these corner cupboards are handy. Of course, this won't remain the smoking room. It has the morning sun, and Ray likes that, so I shall make it into her boudoir. It is a nice room, as you say. That's it, Ted, my boy, said Gordon bitterly. Take a room which is designed by nature and art to be a smoking room and turn it into a boudoir. Turn it into the very deuce of a boudoir, with the morning sun laid on forever and ever. Waste the 12th of August by getting married on it. Spend the winter in foreign parts, and write letters that you can breakfast out of doors, just as if you'd created the mildness of the climate yourself. Come back in the spring and spend the London season in the country, in order to avoid seeing anybody who wants to see you. That's the way to do it. That's the way to get yourself generally loved and admired. That's chiefly imagination, said Sir Edric. I'm blessed if I can see why I should not make this house fit for Ray to live in. It's a queer thing. Ray was a good girl. And you weren't a bad sort yourself. You prepare to go into partnership. And you both straight away turn into despicable lunatics. I'll have a word or two with Ray, but I'm serious about this house. Don't go tinkering it. It's got a character of its own, and you'd better leave it. Turn half Tottenham Court Road, and the culture thereof, heaven help it, into your townhouse if you like, but leave this alone. Haven't got a townhouse yet. Anyway, I'm not going to be unsuitable. I'm not going to feel myself at the mercy of a big firm. I shall supervise the whole thing myself. I shall drive over to Challensee tomorrow afternoon and see if I can't find some intelligent and fairly conscientious workmen. That's all right. You supervise them, and I'll supervise you. You'll be much too new if I don't look after you. You've got an old legend, I believe, that the family's coming to a bad end. You must be consistent with it. As you are bad, be beautiful. By the way, what do you yourself think of the legend? "'It's nothing,' said Sir Edric, speaking, however, rather seriously. "'They say that Hal's planting is haunted by something that will not die. "'Certainly an old woman, who, for some godless reason of her own, "'made her way there by night, was found there dead on the following morning. "'But her death could be and was accounted for by natural causes. "'Certainly, too, I haven't a man in my employ who'll go there by night now.' Why not? How should I know? I fancy that a few of the villagers sit boozing at the stag in the evening and like to scare themselves by swapping lies about Hell's planting. I've done my best to stop it. I once, as you know, took a rug, a revolver, and a flask of whiskey and spent the night there myself. But even that didn't convince them. Yes, you told me. By the way, did you hear or see anything? Sir Edric hesitated before he answered. Finally, he said, Look here, old man, I wouldn't tell this to anyone but yourself. I did think that I heard something. About the middle of the night I was awakened by a cry. 
I can only say that I was the kind of cry that frightened me. I sat up, and at that moment I heard some great heavy thing go swishing through the bracken behind me at a great rate. Then all was still. I looked about, but I could find nothing. At last I argued, as I would argue now, that a man who is just awake is only half awake, and that his powers of observation by hearing or any other sense are not to be trusted. I even persuaded myself to go to sleep again, and there was no more disturbance. However, there is a real danger there now. In the heart of the plantation there are some eaves and a subterranean spring. Lately there has been some slight subsidence there, and the same sort of thing will happen again in all probability. I wired today to an expert to come and look at the place. He has replied that he will come on Monday. The legend says that when the thing that lives in Hal's planting comes up to the hall, the van crests will be ended. If I cut down the trees and then break up the place with a charge of dynamite, I shouldn't wonder if I spoiled that legend. Gurdon smiled. I'm inclined to agree with you all through. It's absurd to trust the immediate impressions of a man just awakened. What you heard was probably a stray cow. No cow, said Sir Edric impartially. There's a low wall around the place. Not much of a wall, but too much for a cow. Well, something else. Some equally obvious explanation. In dealing with such questions, never forget that you're in the 19th century. By the way, your man's coming on Monday. That reminds me, today's Friday, and as an indisputable consequence, tomorrow's Saturday, therefore. If you want to find your intelligent workman, it will be of no use to go in the afternoon. True, said Sir Edric. I'll go in the morning. He walked to a tray on a side table and poured a little whiskey into a tumbler. They don't seem to have brought any seltzer water, he remarked in a grumbling voice. He rang the bell impatiently. Now why don't you use those corner cupboards for that kind of thing? If you kept a supply there, it would be handy in case of accidents. They're full up already. He opened one of them and showed that it was filled with old account books and yellow documents tied up in bundles. The servant entered. Oh, I say, there isn't any seltzer. Bring it, please. He turned again to Gordon. You might do me a favor when I'm away tomorrow. If there's nothing else that you want to do, I wish you'd look through all these papers for me. They're all old. Possibly some of them ought to go to my solicitor, and I know that a lot of them ought to be destroyed. Some few may be of family interest. It's not the kind of thing that I could ask a stranger or a servant to do for me, and I've so much on hand just now before my marriage. But of course, my dear fellow, I'll do it with pleasure. I'm ashamed to give you all this bother. However, you said that you were coming here to help me, and I take you at your word. By the way, I think you'd better not say anything to Ray about the Hell's planting story. I may be some of the things that you take me for, but really, I am not a common ass. Of course I shouldn't tell her. I'll tell her myself, and I'd sooner do it when I've got the whole thing cleared up. Well, I'm really obliged to you. I needn't remind you that I hope to receive as much again. I believe in compensation. Nature always gives it and always requires it. One finds it everywhere, in philology and onwards. I could mention omissions. There are few, and make a belief in the hereafter to supply them, logical. Lunatics, for instance? Their delusions are often their compensation. They argue correctly from false premises. A lunatic believing himself to be a millionaire has as much delight as money can give. How about deformities or monstrosities? The principle is there, although I don't pretend that the compensation is always adequate. A man who is deprived of one sense generally has another developed with unusual acuteness. As for monstrosities, of it all a human type, one sees none. The things exhibited in fairs are, almost without exception, frauds. They occur rarely, and one does not know enough about them. A really good textbook on the subject would be interesting. 
still such stories as i have heard would bear out my theory stories of their superhuman strength and cunning and of the extraordinary prolongation of life that has been noted or is said to have been noted in them but it is hardly fair to test my principle by exceptional cases besides anyone can prove anything except that anything is worth proving that's a cheerful thing to say i wouldn't like to swear that i could prove how the hell's planting legend started but i fancied do you know that i could make a very good shot at it well my great-grandfather kept wolves i can't say why do you remember the portrait of him not the one when he was a boy the other it hangs on the staircase there's now a group of wolves in one corner of the picture i was looking carefully at the picture one day and thought that i detected some overpainting in that corner indeed it was done so roughly that a child would have noticed it if the picture had been hung in a better light i had the overpainting removed by a good man and underneath there was that group of wolves depicted well one of these wolves must have escaped got into hell's planting and scared an old woman or two that would start a story and human mendacity would do the rest yes said guerdon meditatively that doesn't sound improbable but why did your great-grandfather have the wolves painted out four saturday morning was fine but very hot and sultry after breakfast when sir edric had driven off to challensee andrew guerdon settled himself in a comfortable chair in the smoking room the contents of the corner cupboard were piled up on a table by his side he lit his pipe and began to go through the papers and put them in order he had been at work about a quarter of an hour when the butler entered rather abruptly looking pale and disturbed in sir edric's absence sir it was thought that i had better come to you for advice there's been an awful thing happened well they've found a corpse in hell's planting about half an hour ago it's the body of an old man john marsh who used to live in the village he seems to have died in some kind of fit they were bringing it here but i had it taken down to the village where his cottage is then i sent to the police and to a doctor there was a moment or two's silence before guerdon answered this is a terrible thing i don't know of anything else that you could do stop if the police want to see the spot where the body was found i think that sir edric would like them to have every facility quite so sir and no one else must be allowed there no sir thank you the butler withdrew guerdon arose from his chair and began to pace up and down the room what an impressive thing a coincidence is he thought to himself last night the whole of the hell's planting story seemed to me not worth consideration but the second death there it can be only coincidence what else could it be the question would not leave him what else could it be had that dead man seen something there and died in sheer terror of it had sir edric really heard something when he spent the night there alone he returned to his work but he found that he got on with it but slowly every now and then his mind wandered back to the subject of hell's planting his doubts annoyed him it was unscientific and unmodern of him to feel any perplexity because a natural and rational explanation was possible he was annoyed with himself for being perplexed after luncheon he strolled round the grounds and smoked a cigar he noticed that a thick bank of dark slate-colored clouds was gathering in the west the air was very still in a remote corner of the garden a big heap of weeds was burning the smoke went up perfectly straight on the top of the heap light flames danced they were like the ghosts of flames in the strange light a few big drops of rain fell the small shower did not last for five seconds gordon glanced at his watch sir edric would be back in an hour and he wanted to finish his work with the papers before sir edric's return so he went back 
into the house once more. He picked up the first document that came to hand. As he did so, another smaller and written on parchment, which had been folded with it, dropped out. He began to read the parchment. It was written in faded ink, and the parchment itself was yellow and in many places stained. It was the confession of the third baronet. He could tell that by the date upon it. It told the story of that night when he and Dr. Dennison went together, carrying a burden through the long garden, out into the orchard that skirts the north side of the park, and then across a field to a small dark plantation. It told how he made a vow to God and did not keep it. These were the last words of the confession. Already upon me has the punishment fallen, and the devil's wolves do seem to hunt me in my sleep nightly. But I know that there is worse to come. The thing that I took to hell's planting is dead, yet will it come back again to the hall, and then will the van crests be at an end. This writing I have committed to chance, neither showing it nor hiding it, and leaving it to chance, if any man shall read it. Underneath there was a line written in darker ink, and in quite different handwriting. It was dated fifteen years later, and the initials R.D. were appended to it. It is not dead. I do not think that it will ever die. When Andrew Guerdon had finished reading this document, he looked slowly round the room. The subject got on his nerves and he was almost expecting to see something. Then he did his best to pull himself together. The first question he put to himself was this. Has Ted ever seen this? Obviously he had not. If he had, he could not have taken the tradition of Hell's planting so lightly, nor have spoken of it so freely. Besides, he would either have mentioned the document to Guerdon, or he would have kept it carefully concealed. He would not have allowed him to come across it casually in that way. Ted must never see it, thought Guerdon to himself. He then remembered the pile of weeds he had seen burning in the garden. He put the parchment in his pocket and hurried out. There was no one about. He spread the parchment on top of the pile and waited until it was entirely consumed. Then he went back to the smoking room. He felt easier now. Yes, thought Guerdon, if Ted first of all heard of the finding of that body, and then had read that document, I believe he would have gone mad. Things that come near us affect us deeply. Guerdon himself was much moved. He clung steadily to reason. He felt himself able to give a natural explanation, although yet he was nervous. The net of coincidence had closed in around him. The mention of Sir Edric's confession of the prophecy, which had subsequently become traditional in the village, alarmed him. And what did that last line mean? He supposed that R.D. must be the initials of Dr. Dennison. What did he mean by saying that the thing was not dead? Did he mean that it had not really been killed? That it had been gifted with some preternatural strength and vitality and had survived? though Sir Edric did not know it. He recalled what he had said about the prolongation of the lives of such things. If it still survived, why had it never been seen? Had it joined to the wild hardiness of the beast a cunning that was human, or more than human? How could it have lived? There was water in the caves, he reflected, and food could have been secured, a wild beast's food. Or did Dr. Dennison mean that Though the thing itself was dead, its wraiths survived and haunted the place. He wondered how the doctor had found Sir Edric's confession, and why he had written that hue at the end of it. As he sat thinking, a low rumble of thunder in the distance startled him. He felt a touch of panic, a sudden impulse to leave Manstead at once, and, if possible, to take Ted with him. Ray could never live there. He went over the whole thing in his mind, again and again, at one time calm and argumentative about it, and at another shaken by blind horror. Sir Edric, on his return from Challency a few minutes afterwards, 
came straight to the smoking room where Gordon was. He looked tired and depressed. He began to speak at once. You needn't tell me about it, about John Marsh. I heard about it in the village. Did you? It's a painful occurrence, although, of course, stop, don't go into it. Anything can be explained. I know that. I went through those papers and account books while you were away. Most of them may just as well be destroyed, but there are a few. I put them aside there, which might be kept. There was nothing of any interest. Thanks. I'm much obliged to you. Oh, and look here. I've got an idea. I've been examining the plans of the house, and I'm coming round to your opinion. There are some alterations which should be made, and yet I'm afraid that they'd make the place look patched and renovated. It wouldn't be a bad thing to know what Ray thought about it. That's impossible. The workmen come on Monday, and we can't consult her before then. Besides, I have a general notion what she would like. We could catch the night express to town at Challency, and Sir Edric rose from his seat angrily and hit the table. Good God, I don't sit there hunting up excuses to cover my cowardice and making it easy for me to bolt. What do you suppose the villagers would say, and what would my own servants say if I ran away tonight? I am a coward, I know it. I'm horribly afraid, but I'm not going to act like a coward if I can help it. Now, my dear chap, don't excite yourself. If you are going to care at all, to care as much as the conventional dam for what people say, you'll have no peace in life. And I don't believe you're afraid. What are you afraid of? Sir Edric paced once or twice up and down the room, and then sat down again before replying. Look here, Andrew. I'll make a clean breast of it. I've always laughed at the tradition. I forced myself, as it seemed at least, to disprove it by spending a night in Hell's planting. I took the pains even to make a theory which would account for its origin. All the time I had a sneaking, stifled belief in it. With the help of my reason, I crushed that. But now my reason has thrown up the job, and I'm afraid. I'm afraid of the undying thing that is in Hal's planting. I heard it that night. John Marsh saw it last night. They took me to see the body, and the face was awful. And I believe that one day it will come from Hal's planting. Yes, interrupted Gordon, I know. And at present I believe as much. Last night we laughed at the whole thing, and we shall live to laugh at it again and be ashamed of ourselves for a couple of superstitious old women. I fancy that beliefs are affected by weather. There's thunder in the air. No, said Sir Edric, my belief has come to stay. And what are you going to do? I'm going to test it on Monday. I can begin to get to work, and then I'll blow up Hell's planting with dynamite. After that, we shan't need to believe. We shall know. And now let's dismiss the subject. Come down into the billiard room and have a game. Until Monday, I won't think of the thing again. Long before dinner, Sir Edric's depression seemed to have completely vanished. At dinner, he was boisterous and amused. Afterwards, he told stories and was interesting. It was late at night. The terrific storm that was raging outside had awoke Gwerdon from sleep. Hopeless of getting to sleep again, he had arisen and dressed, and now sat at the window seat, watching the storm. He had never seen anything like it before, and every now and then the sky seemed to be torn across, as if by hands of white fire. Suddenly he heard a tap at his door and looked around. Sir Edric had already entered. He also had dressed. He spoke in a curious, subdued voice. I thought you wouldn't be able to sleep through this. Do you remember that I shut and fastened the dining room window? Yes, I remember it. Well, come in here. Sir Edric led the way to his room, which was immediately over the dining room. By leaning out of window, they could see that the dining room window was open wide. Burglar, said Guerdon meditatively. No, 
Sir Edric answered, still speaking in a hushed voice. It is the undying thing. It has come for me. He snatched up the candle and made toward the staircase. Wherdon cut up the loaded revolver, which always lay on the table beside Sir Edric's bed, and followed him. Both men ran down the staircase as though there were not another moment to lose. Sir Edric rushed at the dining room door, opened it a little, and looked in. Then he turned to Guerdon, who was just behind him. "'Go back to your room,' he said authoritatively. "'I won't,' said Guerdon. "'Why? What is it?' Suddenly the corners of Sir Edric's mouth shot outwards into the hideous grin of terror. "'It's there! It's there!' he gasped. "'Then I come in with you. Go back!' With a sudden movement, Sir Edric thrust Guerdon away from the door, and then, quick as light, darted in and locked the door behind him. Guerdon bent down and listened. He heard Sir Edric say in a firm voice, "'Who are you? What are you?' Then followed a heavy, snorting breathing, a low, vibrating growl, an awful cry, a scuffle. Then Gordon flung himself at the door. He kicked at the lock, but it would not give way. At last he fired his revolver at it. Then he managed to force his way into the room. It was perfectly empty. Overhead he could hear footsteps. The noise had awakened the servants. They were standing, tremulous, on the upper landing. Through the open window access to the garden was easy. Guerdon did not wait to get help, and in all probability none of the servants could have been persuaded to come with him. He climbed out alone, and as if by some blind impulse, started to run as hard as he could in the direction of Hal's planting. He knew that Sir Edric would be found there. But when he got within a hundred yards of the plantation, he stopped. There had been a great flash of lightning, and he saw that it had struck one of the trees. Flames darted about the plantation as the dry bracken caught. Suddenly, in the light of another flash, he saw the whole of the trees fling their heads upwards. Then came a deafening crash, and the ground slipped under him, and he was flung forward on his face. The plantation had collapsed, fallen through into the caves beneath it. Guerdon slowly regained his feet. He was surprised to find that he was unhurt. He walked on a few steps, and then fell again. This time he had fainted away. End of Section 10、Section 11 of Stories in the Dark This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Nosetti, davidnosetti.com. Stories in the Dark by Barry Payne. The Grey Cat. I heard this story from Archdeacon M. I should imagine that it would not be very difficult, by trimming it a little and altering the facts here and there, to make it capable of some simple explanation. But I have preferred to tell it as it was told to me. After all, there is some explanation possible, even if there is not one definite and simple explanation clearly indicated. It must rest with the reader whether he will prefer to believe that some of the so called uncivilized races may possess occult powers transcending anything of which the so called civilized are capable. Or whether he will consider that a series of coincidences is sufficient to account for the extraordinary incidents which, in a plain, brief way, I am about to relate. It does not seem to me essential to state which view I hold myself, or if I hold neither, and I have reason for not stating a third possible explanation. I must add a word or two. With regard to Archdeacon M., at the time of this story he was in his fiftieth year. He was a fine scholar, 
a man of considerable learning. His religious views were remarkably broad, his enemies said remarkably thin. In his younger days he had been something of an athlete, but owing to age, sedentary habits, and some amount of self-indulgence, he had grown stout and no longer took exercise in any form. He had no nervous trouble of any kind. His death, from heart disease, took place about three years ago. He told me the story twice, at my request. There was an interval of about six weeks between the two narrations. Some of the details were elicited by questions of my own. With this preliminary note, we may proceed to the story. In January 1881, Archdeacon M., who was a great admirer of Tennyson's poetry, came up to London for a few days, chiefly in order to witness the performance of The Cup at the Lyceum. He was not present on the first night, Monday, January 3rd, but on a later night in the same week. At that time, of course, the poet had not received his peerage, nor the actor his knighthood. On leaving the theatre, less satisfied with the play than with the magnificence of the setting, the archdeacon found some slight difficulty in getting a cab. He walked a little way down the Strand to find one, when he encountered unexpectedly his old friend Guy Bredon. Bredon, that was not his real name, was a man of considerable fortune, a man of the learned societies, and devoted to Central African exploration. He was two or three years younger than the archdeacon, and a man of tremendous physique. Bredon was surprised to find the archdeacon in London, and the archdeacon was equally surprised to find Bredon in England at all. Bredon carried off the archdeacon with him to his rooms, and sent a servant in a cab to the Langham to pay the archdeacon's bill and fetch his luggage. The archdeacon protested, but faintly, and Bredon would not hear of his hospitality being refused. Bredon's rooms were an expensive suite immediately over a ruinous upholsterer's in a street off Berkeley Square. There was a private street door, and from it a private staircase to the first and second floors. The first suite of rooms on the first floor, occupied by Bredon, was entirely shut off from the staircase by a door. The second floor suite, tenanted by an Irish MP, was similarly shut off, and at that time was unoccupied. Bredon and the archdeacon passed through the street door and up the stairs to the first landing, from whence, by the staircase door, they entered the flat. Bredon had only recently taken the flat, and the archdeacon had never been there before. It consisted of a broad L-shaped passage with rooms opening into it. There were many trophies on the walls. Horned heads glared at them, Stealthy but stuffed beasts watched them furtively from under tables. There was a perfect arsenal of murderous weapons gleaming brightly under the shaded gaslights. Bredon's servant prepared supper for them before leaving for the Langham, and soon the two men were discussing Mr. Tennyson, Mr. Irving, and a parody of The Queen of the May, which had recently appeared in Punch, and doing justice to some oysters— a cold pheasant with an excellent salad, and a bottle of seventy-four pommery. It was characteristic of the archdeacon that he remembered exactly the items of the supper, and that Breton rather neglected the wine. After supper they passed into the library, where a bright fire was burning. The archdeacon walked towards the fire, rubbing his plump hands together, as he did so, a portion of the great rug of grey fur on which he was standing seemed to rise up. It was a grey cat of enormous size, larger than any that the archdeacon had ever seen before, and of the same colour as the rug on which it had been sleeping. It rubbed itself affectionately against the archdeacon's leg, and purred as he bent down to stroke it. "'What an extraordinary animal!' said the archdeacon. I had no idea cats could grow to this size. Its head's queer, too, so much too small for the body. Yes, said Breton, 
and his feet are just as much too big. The grey cat stretched himself voluptuously under the archdeacon's caressing hand, and the feet could be seen plainly. They were very broad, and the claws which shot out seemed unusually powerful and well-developed. The beast's coat was short, thick, and wiry. "'Most extraordinary!' the archdeacon repeated. He lowered himself into a comfortable chair by the fire. He was still bending over the cat and playing with it when a slight chink made him look up. Breddon was putting something down on the table behind the liquor decanters. "'Not that I know of. Freakish, I should say. We found him on board the boat when I left for home. May have come there for mice. He'd have been thrown overboard, but for me, I got rather interested in him. Smoke? Oh, thank you. Outside a cold north wind screamed in quick gusts. Within came the sharp scratch of the match on the ribbed glass as the archdeacon lit his cigar, the bubble of the rose-water in Breddon's hookah, the soft step of Breddon's man carrying the archdeacon's luggage into the bedroom at the end of the L-shaped passage, and the constant purring of the big grey cat. "'And what's the cat's name?' the archdeacon asked. Breddon laughed. "'Well, if you must have the plain truth, he's called Grey Devil, or, more frequently, Devil Tout Court. "'Really, now, really, you can't expect an archdeacon to use such abominable language. I shall call him Grey. Or perhaps Mr. Grey would be more respectful, seeing the shortness of our acquaintance.' "'Do you object to the smell of smoke, Mr. Gray? "'The intelligent beast does not object. "'Probably you've accustomed him to it.' "'Well, seeing what his name is, "'he could hardly object to smoke, could he?' "'Breddon's servant entered. "'As the door opened and shut, "'one heard for a moment the crackle "'of the newly lit fire in the room "'that awaited the archdeacon.' The servant swept up the hearth and, under archidiaconal direction, mixed a lengthy brandy and soda. He retired with the information that he would not be wanted again that night. "'Did you notice,' asked the archdeacon, "'the way Mr. Gray followed your man about? I never saw a more affectionate cat.' "'Think so,' said Breddon. "'Watch this time.' For the first time he approached the grey cat and stretched out his hand as if to pet him. In an instant the cat seemed to have gone mad. Its claws shot out, its back hooped, its coat bristled, its tail stood erect. It cursed and spat, and its small green eyes glared. But a close observer would have noticed that all the time it watched not only Breddon, but also the object which had chinked, as Breddon had put it down behind the decanters. The archdeacon lay back in his chair and laughed heartily. Ho, ho, ho! What funny creatures they are, and never so funny as when they lose their tempers! Really, Mr. Gray, out of respect to my cloth, you might have refrained from swearing like that. Poor Mr. Gray! Poor puss. Breddon resumed his seat with a grim smile. The grey cat slowly subsided, and then thrust its head, as though demanding sympathy, into the fat palm of the archdeacon's dependent hand. Suddenly the archdeacon's eye lighted on the object which the cat had been watching, visible now that the servant had displaced the decanters. "'Goodness me!' he exclaimed. "'You've got a revolver there.' "'That is so,' said Breddon. "'Not loaded, I trust.' "'Oh, yes, fully loaded.' "'But isn't that very dangerous?' "'Well, no. I'm used to these things, and I'm not careless with them. I should have thought it more dangerous to have introduced Grey Devil to you without it.' He is much more powerful than an ordinary cat, 
and I fancy there's something beside cat in his pedigree. When I bring a stranger to see him, I keep the cat covered with the revolver until I see how the land lies. To do the brute justice, he has always been most friendly with everybody except myself. I'm his only antipathy. He'd have gone for me just now, but that he's smart enough to be afraid of this. He tapped the revolver. "'I see,' said the archdeacon seriously. "'And can guess how it happened. "'You scared him one day by firing the revolver for joke. "'The report frightened him, and he's never forgiven you or forgotten the revolver. "'Wonderful memory some of these animals have.' "'Yes,' said Breddon. "'But that guess won't do.' I've never intentionally or by chance given the devil any reason for his enmity. So far as I know, he has never heard a firearm, and certainly he has never heard one since I made his acquaintance. Somebody may have scared him before, and I'm inclined to think that somebody did, for there can be no doubt that the brute knows all that a cat need know about a revolver, and that he's scared of it. The first time we met was almost in darkness. I'd got some cases that I was particular about, and the captain had said I could go down to look after them. Well, this beast suddenly came out of a lump of black and flew at me. I didn't even recognize that it was a cat, because he's so mighty big. I fetched him a clip on the side of the head that knocked him off and whipped out my iron. He was away in a streak. He knew, and I've had plenty of proof since that he knows. He'd bite me now if he had the chance, but he understands that he hasn't got the chance. I'm often half inclined to take him on plane, shooting barred, and to feel my own hands breaking his damned neck. Really, old man, really, said the archdeacon in perfunctory protest, as he rose and mixed himself another drink. "'Sorry to use strong language, but I don't love that cat, you know.' The archdeacon expressed his surprise that in that case Breddon did not get rid of the brute. "'You come across him on board ship and he flies at you. You save his life, give him board and lodging, and he still hates you so much that he won't let you touch him.' "'And you are no fonder of him than he is of you. "'Why don't you part company?' "'As for his board, I've rarely known him to eat anything except his own kill. "'He goes out hunting every night. "'I keep him simply and solely because I'm afraid of him. "'As long as I can keep him, I know my nerves are all right. "'If I let my funk of him make any difference, well—' "'I shouldn't be much good in a Central African forest. "'At first I had some idea of taming him. "'And besides, there was a queer coincidence. "'He rose and opened the window, "'and Grey Devil slowly slunk up to it. "'He paused a few moments on the window sill, "'and then suddenly sprang and vanished. "'What was the coincidence?' "'What do you think of that?' Redden handed the archdeacon a figure of a cat which he had taken from the mantelpiece. It was a little thing about three inches high. In colour, in the small head, enormous feet, and curiously human eyes, it seemed an exact reproduction of grey devil. A perfect likeness! How did you get it made? I got the likeness before I got the original. A little Jew dealer sold it to me the night before I left for England. He thought it was Egyptian, and described it as an idol. Anyhow, it was a niceish piece of jade. I always thought jade was bright green. It may be, or white, or brown. It varies. I don't think there can be any doubt that this little figure is old though I doubt if it's Egyptian. Breddon put it back in its place. By the way, 
That same night the little Jew came to try and buy it back again. He offered me twice what I had given for it. I said he must have found somebody who was pretty keen on it. I asked if it was a collector. The Jew thought not, said it was a coloured gentleman. Well, that finished it. I wasn't going to do anything to oblige a nigger. The Jew pleaded that it was a particularly fine buck nigger, with mountains of money, who'd been tracking the thing for years, and hinted at all manner of mumbo-jumbo business to scare me, I suppose. However, I wouldn't listen, and kicked him out. Then came the coincidence. Having bought the likeness, next day I found the living original. Rum, wasn't it? At this moment the clock struck, and the archdeacon recognized with horror that it was very, very much past the time when respectable archdeacons should be in bed and asleep. He rose and said good-night, observing that he'd like to hear more about it on the morrow. This was extremely unfortunate, for it will be seen it is just at this part of the story that one wants full details— and on the morrow it became impossible to elicit them. Before leaving the library, Bredon closed the window, and the archdeacon asked how Mr. Gray, as he called him, would get back. Very likely he is back already. He's got a special window in the kitchen made on purpose, just big enough to let him get in and out as he likes. But don't other cats get in too? No said Breddon. Other cats avoid, grey devil. The archdeacon found himself unaccountably nervous when he got to his room. He owned to me that he had to satisfy himself that there was no one concealed under the bed or in the wardrobe. However, he got into bed, and after a little while fell into a deep sleep. His fire was burning brightly, and the room was quite light. Shortly after four, he was awakened by a loud scream. Still sleepy, he did not for the moment locate the sound, thinking that it must have come from the street outside. But almost immediately afterwards he heard the report of a revolver fired, twice in quick succession, and then, after a short pause, a third time. The archdeacon was terribly frightened. He did not know what had happened, and thought of armed burglars. For a time, he did not think it could have been more than a minute, fear held him motionless. Then, with an effort, he rose, lit the gas, and hurried on his clothes. As he was dressing, he heard a step down the passage and a knock at his door. He opened it and found Breddon's servant. The man had put on a blue overcoat over his night things and wore slippers. He was shivering with cold and terror. "'Oh, my God, sir!' he exclaimed. "'Mr. Breddon shot himself. Would you come, sir?' The archdeacon followed the man to Breddon's bedroom. The smoke still hung thickly in the room. A mirror had been smashed and lay in fragments on the floor. On the bed, with his back to the archdeacon, lay Breddon, dead. His right hand still grasped the revolver, and there was a blackened wound behind the right ear. When the archdeacon came round to look at the face, he turned faint, and the servant took him out into the library and gave him brandy, the glasses and decanters still standing there. Breddon's face certainly had looked very ghastly. It had been scratched, torn and bitten. One eye was gone, and the whole face was covered with blood. "'Do you think it was that brute did it?' "'Sure of it, sir, spraying on his face while he was asleep. "'I knew it would happen one of these nights. "'He knew it, too, always slept with the revolver by his side. "'He fired twice at the brute, but couldn't see for the blood. "'Then he killed himself.' It seemed likely enough, with his eyesight gone, horribly mauled in an agony of pain, possibly believing that he was saving himself from a death still more horrible, Breddon might very well have turned the weapon on himself. "'What do we do now?' the man asked. 
We must get a doctor and fetch the police at once. Come. As they turned the corner of the passage, they saw the door communicating with the staircase was open. Did you open that door? asked the archdeacon. No, said the man, aghast. Then who did? Don't know, sir. Looks as if we weren't at the end of this yet. They passed down the stairs together and found the street door also ajar. On the pavement outside lay a policeman slowly recovering consciousness. Redden's man took the policeman's whistle and blew it. A passing hansom, going back to the mews, slowed up. The cab was sent to fetch a doctor, and communication with the police station rapidly followed. The injured policeman told a curious story. He was passing the house when he heard shots fired. Almost immediately afterwards he heard the bolts of the front door being drawn and stepped back into the neighboring doorway. The front door opened, and a negro emerged clad in a gray tweed suit with a gray overcoat. The policeman jumped out, and without a second's hesitation the black man felled him. "'It was all done before you could think,' was the policeman's phrase. "'What kind of negro?' asked the archdeacon. "'A big man, stood over six foot, and black as coal. He never waited to be challenged.' The moment he knew that he was seen, he hid out. The policeman was not a very intelligent fellow, and there was little more to be got out of him. He had heard the shots, seen the street door open, and the man in grey appear, and had been felled by a lightning blow before he had time to do anything. The doctor, a plain matter-of-fact little man, had no hesitation in saying that Breddon was dead, and must have died almost immediately. After the injuries received, respiration and heart action must have ceased at once. He was explaining something which oozed from the dead man's ear, when the archdeacon could stand it no longer, and staggered out into the library. There he found Breddon's servant, still in the blue overcoat, explaining to a policeman with a notebook that as far as he knew, nothing was missing except a jade image or idol of a cat, which formerly stood on the mantelpiece. The cat, known as Grey Devil, was also missing, and, although a description of it was circulated in the public press, nothing was ever heard of it again. But grey fur was found in the clenched left hand of the dead man. The inquest resulted in the customary verdict, and brought to light no new facts but it may be as well to give what the police theory of the case was according to the police the suicide took place much as breddon's servant had supposed mad with pain and unable to bear the thought of his awful mutilation breddon had shot himself the story of the jade image as far as it was known was told at the inquest the police held that this image was an idol that some uncivilized tribe was much perturbed by the theft of it, and was ready to pay an enormously high price for its recovery. The negro was assumed to be aware of this, and to have determined to obtain possession of the idol by fair means or foul. Fair means failing, it was suggested that the negro followed Breddon to England, tracked him out, and, on the night in question, found some means to conceal himself in Breddon's flat. There it was assumed that he fell asleep, was awakened by the screams and the sound of the firing, and, being scared, caught up the jade image and made off. Realizing that the shots would have been heard outside, and that his departure at that moment would be considered extremely suspicious, he was ready as he opened the street door to fell the first man that he saw. The temporary unconsciousness of the policeman gave him time to get away. The theory sounds, at first sight, like the only possible theory. When the archdeacon first told me the story, I tried to find out indirectly whether he accepted it. Finding him rather disposed to fence with my hints and suggestions, I put the question to him plainly and bluntly. Do you believe in the police theory? He hesitated, 
and then answered with complete frankness, No, most emphatically not. Why? I asked, and he went over the evidence with me. In the first place, I do not believe that Breton, in the ordinary sense, committed suicide. No amount of physical pain would have made him even think of it. He had unending pluck. He would have taken the facial disfigurement and loss of sight as the chances of war, and would have done the best that could be done by a man with such awful disabilities. One must admit that he fired the fatal shot. The medical evidence on that point is too strong to be gainsaid. But he fired it under circumstances of supernatural horror of which we, thank God, know nothing. I'm naturally slow to admit supernatural explanation. Well, let's go on. What's this mysterious tribe the police talk about? I want to know where it lives and what its name is. It's wealthy enough to offer a huge reward. It must be of some importance. The negro managed to get in and secrete himself. How? Where? I know the flat, and that theory won't do. We don't even know that it was the negro who took the little image, though I believe it was. Anyhow, how did the negro get away at that hour of the morning absolutely unobserved? Negroes are not as so common in London that they can walk about without being noticed. Yet not one trace of him was ever found, and equally mysterious is the disappearance of the grey cat. It was such an extraordinary brute, and the description of it was so widely circulated that it would have seemed almost certain we should hear of it again. Well, we've not heard. We discussed the police theory for some time, and something which he happened to say led me to exclaim, Really? Do you mean to say that the grey cat actually was the negro? No, he replied. N not exactly that. Something near it. Cats are strange animals, anyhow. Needn't remind you of their connection with certain old religions or with that witchcraft in which even England today some still believe, and not so long ago almost all believed. I have never, by the way, seen a good explanation of the fact that there are people who cannot bear to be in a room with a cat, and are aware of its presence as if by some mysterious extra sense. Let me remind you of the belief which undoubtedly exists both in China and Japan, that evil spirits may enter into certain of the lower animals, the fox and badger especially. Every student of demonology knows about these things. But that idea of evil spirits taking possession of cats or foxes is surely a heathen superstition which you cannot hold. Well, I have read of the evil spirits that entered into the swine. Think it over, and keep an open mind. End of section 11. Recording by David Nosetti. DavidNosetti.com. End of Stories in the Dark by Barry Payne. Thanks for visiting Timeless Audiobooks. Please remember to like, comment, share, and subscribe for our latest audiobook uploads.